All right, you guys, video's live. This All is right. Mod Hotep, songwriter, producer, engineer. Um, got some of the Pensadian fam here. Um, we're covering Mike Cave Loft, Loft Mastering. And uh, guys, introduce yourself. Andrew. Afternoon, guys. I'm uh, Andrew Glassford, uh, studio engineer, currently interning at Project 9 Studios in Winnington with uh, the lovely Andrew Spence. Uh, so to hang out and learn a bit about mastering with Mr. Cave. So, yeah. All right, your turn, Dwayne. Hey, my name is Dwayne. I'm a producer from Toronto, Ontario. That's it. <laughs> Bill Kamak, video editor, producer, mixer, social media guy. And our special guest for today is Mike Cave. Take it away, Mike. <laughs> Hi, guys. You all right? Oh, thanks, thanks for, for joining me, man. It's um, I mean, I don't know. I guess I should just say a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm primarily a mixer, um, and I run a mastering company, um, Loft Mastering. And between the two things, pretty much takes up all my time. And now and again, do um production. Um, sometimes I work with other producers, actually recording now and again now. But it's mainly mixing and and, and mastering. Um, and I'm really enjoying the, the the two processes. I suppose, like a lot of people might say, it's a bit unusual to be doing those two things. Um, but I think you see in a bit more of that now. I've been doing mastering and mixing for like 15, 20 years, um, along with a lot of recording. As time's gone on, I've done less recording and um, just concentrated on on those two processes, mixing and mastering, really. Um, but the way those two those two processes cross over for me works really well. Like a lot of people separate the two things. Um, so you know, it's a, it, everyone to their own, and some people might actually like to be able to keep those two things separate. But for me, in this climate nowadays, it, it works for me to be able to just um, offer those two things up and, and almost merge the two as well. So if that you're makes saying, some sort of sense. You're saying almost merge the two. You don't you don't have the two going on in, in the session at the same time. Not all the time, but there will come a point uh, um, during my mixing that I'll introduce mastering. Like a lot of people do this now, and I call it mock mastering. So it it won't necessarily be the final mastering settings, but it's it's giving you an idea of what that job's going to sound like when it comes back from mastering while you've still got the mix up. Because I'm sure we've we've all seen this in the past where you'll 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 do a mix that you're happy with, you'll send it for mastering and sometimes those things that they do at the mastering stage will have a knock-on effect to your balance. Um, a lot of the time this happens and it might be that it tucks the vocal in or you know, th there's various things that can happen at that stage that you think you might have the mix that you wanted and then it comes back wrong. So to be able to, to, to hear something mock mastered during your mix for me, um, it, it, any of those things, those issues that might happen at the mastering stage, you've already flagged them um, as you're mixing. Um, but saying that, um, you can also fool yourself into thinking your mix is better than it is if you're starting to sort of master on your mix bus type thing. So you've got to be very careful with it. But I introduce it later on in the mix. So you, you, you already make sure your mix is working without it. And that, and then you can start introducing those things. We're often talking about um, having a different environment where the master and engineer comes in and does his thing. Um, yeah. But, not, but it just it seems to me that the the power of being able to like if you and I were doing this and I was mixing and you were mastering and everything I do you come in you do your mastering stuff then I come in and adjust the mix according to what you've done. And we go back and forth. It just seems that just seems yeah. so powerful to me. What to be able to go to to going back and forth or to to avoid that? Yes, avoid that, that just seems so powerful to me. If if I if I get a mix going and then you come in and do mastering type stuff on say the master fader, and yeah. and then I come back in, I listen. My levels have been altered because of that. I come back in and start making adjustments, and then you make adjustments, and we go back and forth. That to me seems so powerful. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, obviously, we've done that. You know, we were doing that a long time ago, but that's when the budgets were a lot bigger and you could afford to, you know, 
sit on a mix and send it off for mastering and then judge that when it comes back and maybe revisit the mix again and and it's not very time efficient or budget efficient to be doing that nowadays and I think that's where the beauty of the, the way I work now comes into play is that you can address things before they become an issue you know um, but saying that I, I mean it depends on your your environment as well I mean I, I'm lucky enough here to have the room sounding good the monitors are great and I, I know where I am you know um, and I think the beauty for some people of having a mastering guy to send something to is that change of environment and maybe superior monitoring and stuff like that so it doesn't always work but if you can get used to your room like I've been in this room over 10 years now so I know it very well um, and I think that's a big part of it. It, it you know aside from equipment and whatever it's like just knowing what records sound like in that room is a big part. I think Dwayne has one for you. Yeah. All right. uh, yeah, I do. First off, shout out to the plugging in the background, the AB thing going on. Have you have you seen that thing, man? Yeah, it's amazing. It. I've only just got it. Have you, it's great. Who else has got this? Sorry, I didn't know you could see that. <laughs> I thought I was like, that is great because um, uh, to delve into that ten year um, experience you have there. Uh, what is your uh, thought process when you receive a track for mastering that's not your own? Um, usually, uh, the mastering engineers that I talk to have an order of things that they go through, a checklist. What's yours? Um, first, number number one, uh, communication with, with the clients and the artist, because you'd be surprised how many jobs come over with no brief. You know, the, the files will arrive, and I... I actually sort of make it my first thing to do is contact them if they don't send a brief then contact them and find out what they want from it because I mean especially with mixing I mean you, you get sent multi-track files and, and you could take that mix a hundred a thousand different ways you know um, and without a brief then it's hard to nail it in terms of what that person wants or that you know the, the, the whole team want from that record so I think that's for me is so key is like how you know clear reference points um where's the where's this heading and some people don't you know if some people aren't sure then but I'll take the lead and I'll suggest and deliver things that I think work but more often than not I'll 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 inquire first and just make sure we're on the same page before I even like really start you know doing anything on the equipment and then that's the mixing stage or the mastering stage? Both, both. I'd say it's more crucial at the mix stage because um, obviously it's a lot more of an open book at that stage. You know, when when something comes in for mastering, then it has a it has a, a sound and a, a, a you know an imprint on it. So it's more obvious what where you should take it at the mastering stage. But even then, I still think in terms of like loudness, um, you know. Low end is, is like can be drastically different um, when it comes to taste and things like that. So unless you really flag those things and say, okay, well, how how do you want me to take this? Then it's 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 just a bit of a guessing game, you know. A bit of a follow up to that. Um, what do you find? Is there something that's more of a problem than it was ten years ago? Well, how have that style changed yeah. in terms of uh, changed a lot you now? A lot. Um, I mean the the main the main factor really if we if we're all honest about it is uh, this is a general sense that a uh, general picture nowadays is that the quality of recordings ha has gone down generally it's not always the case but and it's purely because it's it's mainly budget led and the fact that a lot of artists are making their own records they're engineering their own records and it's basically means that you have to make more decisions and fix more problems later on so um, by the time stuff comes in for mixing or mastering sometimes it's there's a lot of problems to solve a lot more than there used to be um, we're getting a lot of stem mastering jobs now so this is where I'm talking about the mixing and the mastering blending together it's like people are sending stems and some Sometimes they're sending quite a lot of stems, you know, almost to the point of, do you want me to mix this, <laughs> or is this a, is this a mastering job, you know? Right. <laughs> That's it, it, um, it it's just blurred. It's blurred the lines even more. Um, 
But saying that, you know, the results that that we can get from STEM mastering jobs can be incredible, you know. And it, a lot of people maybe don't have the budgets to to hire mixers, um, uh, but they're prepared to pay a little bit more in the mastering stage and spend a bit more time to to work with stems and get the result they want, you know. Um, and also as well, I think like, um. I, mean, I can't really speak for other mastering engineers, but a lot of the time, um, I have seen it in the past where mastering guys won't question things. Like they'll, they'll, um, they might receive files that they don't particularly like and just master them. Whereas I think if I try and get files as upfront as I can from the session, have a listen, and if there's any issues, like you know, maybe I don't know, maybe they send a stereo file, say for instance, um, for mastering, and. I don't know, say the guitar's a, a swamp in the vocal or something like that, then rather than me trying to like compromise it and, and get a sort of thing that works, I'd rather go back to the client and say, you know what, is there any chance you can send me an instrumental uh, and an acapella? And then I can EQ the instrumental and just carve out a bit more space for the vocal or something like that. And um, it just, it just, Makes for such such an improved product at the end, you know. I just want so, to add um, something there. Uh, people, remember: <laughs> send an instrumental, send an acapella, send the beat itself, send the TV mix with the volume slightly lower. Yeah. Send a performance version to your mastering guy. Or yeah, mixing. yeah. I mean, not all the time, though. You know, I don't want to really generalize because some stuff comes in for master and it sounds fantastic, and it doesn't need a lot, you know, if anything, really. Um, so, but I think as a, in answer to that question about how things have changed, I think there's been a, a definite dip in sonic quality um, over the years. I, I, and you know, I'm, I, that's a general thing. It's not um, it's not every job, but I think, and you know, it's it's obvious why that's happening because people aren't getting, um, you know, artists are just making their own, making it up as they go along. You know, but sometimes saying that that can make for better records as well. So. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say it's a bad thing. And also the tools that we've got nowadays are a lot more surgical as well. So there's a lot of stuff that we wouldn't have been able to fix 10 years ago that we can now. So, you know, it's just moving with the times, isn't it? It's no big deal. Really. What um, Dwayne was saying there, do you think that's why STEM mastering is becoming more um, commonplace? Because people are wanting that more choice at the mastering level and you need TV versions and ones, you know, to use for club mixes and stuff. Do you think that's why it's happening, or is it just a, a case of people don't trust themselves to finish mixes off because people are doing it themselves now? Yeah, that's basically what it is. I mean, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of engineers who, who can mix um, to a point, um, and it might be, they might get 80% there with it, and, you know, they might send it to a mixer that starts again from scratch, and they might not get the vibe of that, of what they've done. So there's no guarantee that they're going to be able to hire a mixer and, and nail it. So if they get 80% there with their mix, then the stem mastering is a, is a great solution to take it that extra 20%, you know, and still keep the vibe that they intended. So um, yeah, you know, it, it's just a it's just a great way of of, um, of taking it the extra mile, you know. Uh, I have a bit of a follow-up question with something you just said there, um, with the uh, the gear changing and the plugins changing. What has been the biggest leap in your time um, mastering in terms of you couldn't even imagine to do that ten years ago? Um. Wow. You know what? I mean, having said that about the tools, I'm not doing. I'm not doing a lot massively differently than I've always done, you know? I mean, it's still... I always say to people, don't worry so much about the equipment. It's what comes out the speakers that matters. Because, you know, I mean, we can... You know, uh, don't get me wrong, equipment and tools are very important, and, you know, we know how to use certain tools to get certain results and stuff like that. But really, at the end of the day, when that record's on the radio, no one cares how it was made, what equipment was used. and So I think... Really, there's we can overanalyze that process, and really, I think it's down to really just trusting your ears and you and you know what comes out the speakers is what really matters. 
Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, actually. I don't know if that... <laughs> but I'm trying to think of what... I mean, when I say you talk about the, the new technology and the new plugins and things, I think really I'm talking about this, the surgical side of actually, like, removing problems and, you know, those type of, like, this, the, um, the sonic suppressor is something I use a lot of um, because you can really get into... A problem area and remove it very easily, and only only do that, you know. Um, I mean, you look at some of the cedar tools and stuff that um, you can actually like draw out problems and you know squeaky chairs out of piano takes and all sorts of things like that. I mean, you know, there's no way we would have been able to do that ten years ago. So, <laughs> I like that term you had mock mastering. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I have something similar to that. Uh, if people are doing that, like let's say somebody was going to not send anything to the mastering engineer at all, uh, how would you suggest they go about that? Would it be putting all the plugins on the two bus and doing it all in one session, or are you a fan of doing a mix in one session and then doing some kind of mock mastering in a totally different session on a two track? Well, what what I do personally when I'm mixing is that the reason that I call it mock mastering is that I'm not really doing anything different than I would in a mastering session, aside from the fact that I, my brain is in mix mode. So what I do in an ideal situation, which is usually fine, um, is to deliver the mix with the mock mastering, and then once the mix has been approved, then I'll go back and I'll actually treat it as a mastering session on that stereo file. Um, and sometimes I might not change very much. In fact, usually I don't. But when you um, say, it's just coming back to it with fresh ears, you know. When you say treat it as a mastering session on that file, do you yeah. mean you're taking off things that you had on it before when you did the mock mastering and replacing them, or you're using what you already have and accentuating that? Um, I'd say in like maybe. Most situations, I'd probably just embellish what I've already done. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes I might have overcooked it in the mix at the mix stage. I might have got a bit excited, and you know, <laughs> so so I think just being able to come back fresh after a couple of days or a week or whatever, and just you know, come in and go, okay, let's just forget about the multi-track now. Let's just focus on this stereo file and just make sure that what I did makes sense. You know. But I said a lot of the time I don't really change that much from that point anyway. When you say in the stereo file, are you meaning you, you actually have bounced the, the mix out without the mastering plugins and then you apply mastering stuff or you're, or you're actually going back into the session? Well, I'll go back into the session usually because oh. um, although I will have printed fire, I will have printed stereo pre-masters anyway at the mix stage, but um, it's just, you know, this is the world we live in, isn't it, with recall now. It's so easy to just reboot the whole session. Um, and then I can get my analog chain as it was and just tweak, you know, just, just sign off the mastering really at that stage. And then maybe, maybe say for instance, I might just want to push a couple of things in the mix and it's there for me to be able to do it if I need to. Okay, real quick. Matthew Weiss um, had a question the other day. He said, um, mastering engineers, what makes you decide to reach for a compressor? What do you hear that makes you go, okay, compression on the whole record? Is that a question? What is that a question he's fired to me, or was he asking? He was asking if Pensado students. Um, yeah. But the whole idea was he wanted to know what would make a master engineer decide to grab a compressor. What do you hear that makes you decide something that, that the mix needs um, compression? <laughs> it's, but that's a great question. I mean, I'm not quite sure whether my answer would tally with everyone else's. I mean, I think it's just. I guess for, from years of, of using equipment, I, I tend to, um, I guess it's a bit like driving a car where you you drive a car for so long that you don't think about it. Um, and I guess that's sort of the way I work. I don't really think too much about what I'm doing. I just, I don't know, it's just like a... So you've used the tool so much, you just go? Whatever serves the song, right? Yeah, I mean, it's not, um, don't get me wrong, I don't always get the right choice straight away, but, um, you know, 
I think I just jump from it's just like sculpting something, isn't it? You know, you jump from one thing to another, and if it works, you you, you embellish, you work on from that. If it doesn't work, you take a step back and take a different route. And I, th I don't think it's it's not something that I really analyse. It's just something that I, as I say, it, it goes back to that um, thing of what comes out the speakers and trusting your ears. So it's not. Um, so you talk in terms of attitude, maybe, for each compressor, like um, the API gives me a bit of this, or... Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, the, you know, this is the thing about knowing your tools, isn't it? You know, I think you can have too many choices as well. Like, nowadays, we have a hell of a lot of choice, man. I mean, just compressors alone in terms of, like, plugins and stuff is, is insane, you know? And I've actually pulled it back in a little bit now in terms of like I don't um I don't actually have that many plugins now. I, I go to the same five or ten compressors maybe that and everything else I've taken out my plugin folders because it just complicates the decision making process. Yeah, does, so yeah. you know you know you get I think for me anyway personally I like to have a, a small amount of great tools that I can just jump in and I've got a tool for every situation, but that can only, you know, maybe I've only got like 10 EQs or t and 10 compressors maybe, um, s probably five outboard EQs and five outboard compressors maybe, and just keeping it simple because otherwise you spend the whole day going, oh, I wonder, I wonder if that one has done better yeah. or it's, you know, you just got to keep things moving and just keep it fluid, otherwise you, you, you start questioning yourself. <laughs> so. Nice. That actually brings us to our next question, which was by two people in the Facebook thread, both by Ludwig Diaz and Jason Lackey, which is, can you please explain your mastering chain, how you set up your gain staging, and how each piece of gear affects the next? Okay. Right, this is, I was, I'm glad this has come up, actually, because this is something that I, I, I'm loving the the group, by the way. I think it's wicked, and it's it's. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Appreciate your involvement. It's it's just. I tell you what's great about these these type of groups is that nowadays we're all working a lot more in our own bubbles. So you know we're not in. You know when I when I was, I, I was sort of an in-house engineer at a studio. We had like lots of different people coming in and out, and you've got that community there. Now that's gone. It's like these things are great to to keep this rolling. But cool. I'm, I'm diverging slightly, but what, <laughs> the, reason, the reason why I say that is because what one of the things that I noticed on the on this group and, and on a lot of these type of things is that people ask questions of like, what do you do on your guitars, or you know, what do you, what EQ do you have on your vocals and stuff like that? And it's like, for me, every job is different, you know, and I, I don't have, I wouldn't say I have a method of. I think that can actually restrict you if you if you go into if I go into a mastering job and before I've even heard the record I've already got my chain sorted and that for me is just so back to front it's like first of all it's like I'll come in in the morning and the files will be up on the computer I'll have a listen to what's what the first job is and then I'll make my decision about about what I'm going to do with it and what it needs because um like I mastered a job yesterday that um, I tried um, a couple of different analog pieces on, on it, and um, it actually didn't need to be converted into it. Just it just it just sounded right digitally, so I left it in the digital domain, mastered it, and moved on. And it's like I think if you've got a set thing in your head of like whatever this job is that comes in today, I'm gonna do this to it, and it's like you can't really think of it like that. Um, so I know that doesn't really answer the question, but I think I think the key to it is just keep an open mind with every job and try not to get stuck in your routine of, you know, this is what I do with vocals and this is what I do with this chain and that chain. And I think it's just, if you can just try things, by all means, you, you've got your own little tricks that work a lot of the time, but just try not to get stuck in those if you if that makes sense yeah so it seems yeah it makes sense it seems like what you're saying is basically play into whatever your personal taste is well yeah i mean the problem with my personal taste is it's not always what the client wants and i think that 
comes back to that communication, you know, and at, at the end of the day, these these projects that, you know, we're lucky enough to work on aren't our records, you know, and... And that's a good point. Do, so do you do supervised edits where somebody would actually be there while you're doing it, or would you do yeah. a version and then send it to somebody and then get revisions? There's various ways of doing it. I mean, a lot of a lot more of the work nowadays is unattended, but um, it's quite common for an artist to come in at the end of a project when, say, for instance, if I'm mixing an album, that um, they can come in for the last few days and we can tweak all the mixes and you know that that's that's actually really 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 um an enjoyable process it's a lot more enjoyable for me than doing stuff online but then we do have like you know you can stream mix buses to people quite easily now so we do a lot of that especially if if the client's not in the UK for me then um sure. source live nice cast that kind of say again you have Source Live, Nice Cast, that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, they're really good and save, you know, hundreds of emails going back and forth. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time people hire you for your taste as well. So I think that's just good to pin that down before you start a job. It's like, okay, well, are you, are you hiring me for, for me to put my imprint on something or are you hiring me to, to be your tour guide and, and help yeah, you to get there? And that's really important for me. I just want to make sure we're on the same page before we start something. You know, it's interesting that you're you're talking about that because I I walk in from studio to studio, couldn't care less what the tools are in there, and when I leave out, people will say, "Hey, my, uh, let me listen to your mix," and I don't have a mix out of there. I, I I wouldn't have a mix that's my actual what I would consider my sound. It would be yeah. truly what that person wanted and. I mean, I've done stuff to where it is simply not something that I would have done, and the person loves it. It's it's purely based off of their taste. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I yeah, that's a totally valid point. I mean, I think, like, I don't work in as many studios as I used to by a long shot. You know, I've got a room here that works for all pretty much every job that comes in. I'll be able to deal with it here because I know the room so well. Um, and sometimes, like, I get asked by clients to go to their studio and help them finish a mix or something like that. And it's like, I can do that, but they're not going to get the best out of me by me being in their room, you know? So it's... Do you bring references with you? Sorry? Do you bring references with you when you go to their studio or no? Yeah, always. Always, yeah. Always. That's the first thing, you know, even... From one of the first things that I got taught as an intern was um, as soon as you walk in a room, which we used to work in a different studio every day, you know, or every week, and first thing to do is put a CD on and listen to the speakers and the room, um, because without that, you're totally guessing, you know. Um, and I still do that every day, you know. I'll come in and put records on while we're setting up, and, and even though I know this room inside out, sometimes your ears are different, you know. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I get a little bit of hay fever in the summer. I might have a little cold or something so, sometimes, and your ears work don't work the same every day. So I think that those references are your benchmark, aren't they, where, you know, if you come in and, and the track sounds a little bit dull to you that you know really well, it's like, okay, <laughs> what's going on with my ears? Now? So, it, yeah, I still do a lot of that. I know a, a lot of mastering guys don't do that from what I've seen, you know, from sitting in with other mastering guys, they don't reference that much, but you know it's what works for for everyone else. So. If I could take a step back for a second, um, yeah. you said that you not having a set chain is is preferable to work, um, but we all tend to gravitate to certain things. Is there anything in particular that you find yourself using again and again because it does a certain thing very well? Yeah, I mean I think that's what's I think that's that's down to the choices. <laughs> well, no, I mean that that's down to the choices that you make um, with the equipment that you 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 buy, you try, you like it, and you buy it. And I think that you know you can't. I don't think it's really feasible to have every analog compressor on the market in a room because it you know there wouldn't be space and it'd get a bit hot. <laughs> so you basically dwindle. I suppose over time you you work out what works what bits of kit work best for you and uh, and 
you choose to buy those bits of kit and put them in. So even though I might I might say, oh, I, know, I don't have a, chain, a specific chain, I've got choices of maybe like five compressors or five EQs. So and that keeps it. You don't want much more than that, really, because it just you have gets your favorite to... of those. Sorry, what's your, what's your favorite of those compressors or EQs? Um, it's really difficult to say because you can't. You can't. They all have different characters, and what character might work on a specific record might just not work at all on another record. Like I, I, I um. I tried on a recent job. I tried um, the Manly Very Moo on a mastering job, um, and it it wasn't really it wasn't really working. I couldn't quite pin down, but it was just adding a bit too much character. And then, funny enough, chatting to the the guy who mixed it, he'd actually mixed it through the exact same compressor. Um, now I don't know. I mean, that's just one example, but it's like you can overdo something with character if you're not careful, or and that's that's where it just comes back to just using your ears and what's um what you think is it is suitable and um for me as well blind testing is absolutely crucial like my eyes just fool me all the time you know so it's like i need to i need to be able to have like on the console have some sort of by what it might sound a bit stupid but what i do i'll bypass something and i'll close my eyes and hit it a few times so so I'm not actually sure whether it's in or out of that of that particular insert or whatever, um, and then you can properly judge what you're hearing. Um, but if I can see that something's switched in on the desk, it's already fool fooling my decision making. You know, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it's frightening how powerful you, it, your eyes can sort of overpower things. You know. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm <laughs> probably probably wandering off the subject a little bit. No, but, I, I do that all a lot of myself all the time, bro. Yeah. Oh uh, man, and the thing with the screens and all that as well, it's like, oh, uh, it just drives me mad. I just try and switch them off as much as I can. Um, it's a yeah, it's a nightmare. Andrew, uh, I got a question for you, man. Um, yeah, yeah. So, how much does the actual environment that someone would, would hear a piece of music affect your mastering? So, for example, um. The Tinchy Strider work he did on that Oh No track. Um, yeah. That's most likely going to be heard in two places, probably the club and on small earbuds or cans. So how much of that do you take into consideration when you're actually going to start working on, on a project? Well, I take all of it all of it into consideration. This is this is one of the one of the things that I do a lot of is I, I do a lot of um recently as well I've been doing a hell of a lot of urban and club records that um that want to cross over to radio. So a lot of those producers, they can make club records all day long and they'll sound amazing in a club, but they're struggling to sit vocals and stuff for radio. And that's why they're coming to me. And funnily enough, I've been learning a lot from those guys about what works in a club. You know, I mean, you probably show me age a little bit here now, but I don't go clubbing as much as I used to, you know. So um, I, I've actually, it's been really interesting over the last couple of years listening to DJs and and producers making those type of records and what what works for them in that environment um, and I say they've just been coming to me to try and make it work across the board you know so you know they can make you know it's at times they've been able to guide me what works at club they might take a, a version away and play it that night somewhere and then come back with some feedback and and then at the same time I'm working on the more sort of radio side of things um, so and so I think I think it's basically that's the key to it is to try and make you can make records work in both those environments and earbuds and but a big part of that for me is listening on loads of different speakers and things like that and you know laptops little crappy I've got them dotted all around the studio like little hi fi's and a TV I've got a TV in the lounge wired in so I can walk out the room and put the TV on and the mix is coming out the TV and you sick. know. All those things are really crucial to getting being able to nail that. I think for me. But so, what do you think strikes that balance? Like, so say if we go back to like a club versus a radio track, would it be the presence of the vocal more in, in the radio track as opposed to like the beats and the bass, or is it a case of just trying to get an overall balance for the radio as opposed to being so bottom heavy in a club area? If that um, makes sense. <laughs> well. It's it's all about um, 
uh, how can I explain this? It, it's especially with something like bottom end and loudness and stuff like that. It, it's almost like it's the stuff that you take away that gives the power. Right. So, yeah, like this is where a lot of a club club sort of producers they their their bottom end is just very um, very busy sonically, I guess, in terms of the, what's there. So, it's I do a lot of um, notching. Like really, really tight notching a digital EQ, just to try and create space at the bottom end, and it gives this perception of of um, the track being bigger, even though you've actually taken stuff away. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not sure that answers your question there, that's but actually, you, that's actually a question you you're getting into. You're getting into a question that we have from the uh, Facebook page, which is from Ken Lanyon. Who says I would love to hear your approach to evening out low end, most specifically bass or synth bass? Yeah, well, I, I, I can tell you a little bit more about that in a sec. Actually, I'm just trying to answer Andrew's question a bit better. Um, I mean, a lot. I think a lot, a lot of the problems that I find, if we've got something that we're trying to make work in in club and on radio and it, it's not working in one or the other environment, a lot of the time it's nothing to do with the sonics and the overall EQ. It's more about the arrangement in the song and the space or lack of it right, that yeah. becomes a problem, you know? Um, and this happens quite a lot where people will send references, say reference track, and they'll go, well, you know, we want it to be this punchy, but then you look at the arrangement in their song and it's too busy. So there isn't the space for the punch, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I think that is a big part of it. Is like flagging, okay, why isn't this working in every environment? And sometimes it's because of that those reasons, you know, that you've you've almost overcooked the arrangement and the production a little bit too much. So it'd be a case of having to write more like dance-based tracks, similar in like pop arrangements instead, to get that sort of um, radio play balance better. Yeah, um, or, or or just prioritize the parts in the song as well because you've got if you listen to like most if you pick like the ten most like punchy tracks in your on your iTunes or whatever, you'll find that there's probably like two or three key elements to that track that are really prominent, and everything else is embellishment. So right. I think that's what. So it's almost. It, I'm not saying you should be taking things out of the arrangement necessarily, but maybe just prioritizing the right things um, and maybe just tucking some things in to create the space. So it's the balance of the mix, really, I guess, more than... Or, or being brutal and taking stuff out, yeah. Do you find yourself <laughs> doing that? Do you um, go back to the, uh, the artist and say, this is a little bit too busy for what you're wanting? Um, yeah, yeah. Or sometimes, sometimes I'll I'll deliver a couple of versions of something, and go, you know, this is the punchy version with a few things missing out of there, and this is like what I've tried to do with what you've given me and kept everything in place. But um, yeah, just to give a couple of options and to let them hear how punchy something can be if you take a couple of things out. Or uh... great man, cheers. Um, oh, Dwayne, do you want to jump in? Oh yes. Um... So you said... Time uh, out, time out, time out. Okay. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Next this point was, was Ken Lanyon, I'm sorry. Which, was, <laughs> which was, I would love to hear your approach to evening out low end, most specifically bass or synth bass. And I had a kind of uh, connection to that because you were talking about earlier notching out frequencies in the low mm -hmm. end, which makes sense to me but might not make sense to other people who just heard you say that. So are you yeah. saying something such as, the kick wants 50 hertz, so you might take the bass and notch out 50 there. Or what? What? What are you saying? Yeah, because you've got. If you look at if you look at everything below, say 300 hertz, you've got. You know, the laws of physics say that you've got. You've got that frequency range, and you've only got so much level available in there, and you've got to fit in all those elements. Like you kick, you might have two or three kicks. You might have two or three basses going on, and a lot of like electronic things um, and you've got to make sure that they're not fighting for that space really so you've got to you've got to make decisions about okay what let's look at the kicks for instance right so you might you might have been given three kicks on the multi-track to mix 
Yep. So you've got to look at those three kicks and go, well, okay, what? which one of those three is, is the weight? Where's the weight coming from out of those three? So you pick that one and you make it heavy. You know, you make it do its job. Then you go to the, the second kick and take out just maybe it might be a kick that has got a click to it, the top end, you know, and you want that click. So it's just roll off all that bottom end, that, that, get rid of it because it's only going to phase cancel and cause problems for that first heavy one. So just be brutal. Get rid of that bottom end out of that. Let the heavy one do its job. Then this, the third kick might be totally unnecessary. You know what I mean? It's like you might not even need that third kick or you just gotta, you got to try things. Then once you've got that sorted, then you've got to look at your bases and go, well, that kick's great now, but this base is just getting all, the, all in the way of it. So as you say, you're right. You know, Find out what the center frequency of that kick is and let it have that space, and then mold the kick at the bases around it. Um, and what one thing I was gonna, sh- I think I did share this the other day on um, on the group page. Can you can you guys see that? <laughs> A little closer. Yeah, right there. I should be able to focus. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'll, yep. I'll put I'll put a link to this on um on the group page because. I use this all the time, and it's like it's great for bass guitars or bass instruments where you get in, you know, you want to just give a bit more definition in the bottom end. Nice. You can just get on your keyboard, work out what the notes are, and just get um, a really, really tight EQ and just notch those things out. There's not many plugins that I actually like to do that, and the only one I'll give a little plug here to the uh, Q10, the Waves Q10. For me, that's like one of the tightest notch notch EQs that um, I can find. Even when it, it goes, well, it's a hundred Q, I think, isn't it? Something. Um, yeah, ridiculous like that. But even some of the plugins that have that type of tight Q on them, they do, for some reason they take out too much information for me. A lot of them, the ones I've tried. So I go back to the Q10 is a good one for actually just using this this chart. And just not getting rid of things that you, that just don't need to be there, or and you can cut up to 10, 15 dB sometimes in that frequency if you need to, and it doesn't affect the overall signal, you know. Nice. And that that's that's how I create the space. In, in, you ever automate just, that that EQ notch? The thing the thing with it is, is it's so tight. It's the notch is so tight that you don't really need to automate it. Sometimes I do, but. It doesn't affect the rest of the signal as much as you'd think it might, you know. Um, if you need I mean, when I say 10, 15 dB, that's suppressor. say again. And if you need to automate, you can just use the suppressor. Yeah, but the suppressor doesn't go anywhere near as tight. Really? In terms okay. of bandwidth. Okay. So they're different tools, really. But um, the suppressor I probably automate more often than the. The Q10, really, because once you've notched it out, it's sort of done its job, and you can move on. Um, if that if that makes sense, like, well, um, but again, no rules, you know. I mean, I might end up. I've, I've got to finish a mix today. I might end up EQ automating the Q10 on that. I don't know. Right. But more often than not, I don't really tend to have to automate it too much. Maybe just automate on and off, you know, in a certain part of the song. But I wouldn't automate the gains as much. But Are just you. Is it good now, Bill? Can I go now, Bill? <laughs> yeah? All right. <laughs> um, the question I had earlier was um, you were talking about listening on different speakers and in this uh, iPhone, iPod, iPod Touch type age with these little um, speakers, I-, I noticed on your site it says Master for iTunes. You have that yeah. prominently displayed. Can you explain to me and everyone else what it, what does that entail? What does that mean, mastered for iTunes? Digital mastering. Okay. Sounds like an oxymoron a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of people don't know much about it, and this is something that I, in fact, this week I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna put a link up explaining what this is. This is for because we're doing the loft mastering site. We're doing. Um, a mastering series, the geeky stuff explained. So every week or every couple of weeks, we'll put up a link to something like like that. And funnily enough, that's the next one on the on the list is the iTunes one. Um, basically, I Apple introduced. I think Apple basically flagged that the MP3s and AACs weren't great. 
you know, and they, they wanted to deliver something that was more like a CD quality. Um, so they introduced like a new codec um, that they've called Mastered for iTunes, and it's it, it's very very close to CD. It's 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 you know I think it's the best sort of compressed format that's available at the moment. So it's, not even, it's not an MP3. It's a completely new. It's an AAC, but it's a, it's a certain type of AAC that's iTunes plus AAC, um, and basically um, when you master for iTunes. What tends to happen a lot of the time is that people will master the CD, and then that'll go off to the factory to be to be pressed, and then the files will go off to iTunes, so they'll be CD quality files. But the beauty of the iTunes, the master for iTunes program, is that um, Apple basically um, sent out all this information to the mastering houses, not all of them, but basically to start making sure that their procedures were we're adhered to to make sure we get the best out of the files and what we do we deliver um, high definition files so we can we send the CD off to the factory but then separate from that we, we create um, a folder of file of high definition files so there'll be 24 bit and um, they, they can't accept 32 bit just yet but that's coming as well and um, so it might be you know if this if the project was mixed at 96k then we can actually send 96k 24 bit files to Apple, and then they can they can send that straight through their codec. So you know you're not basically they're getting like the best definition that they can at that early stage. Um, but I just I think the only the only issue now is just making it making people a bit more aware of it because as you say you weren't sure a lot most people aren't sure what it is and basically it's down to the record companies and the people that are putting the records up on iTunes, they have to choose whether they want that format. Um, so, and to be honest with you, it's fairly limited. Like, if you go on, on your iTunes store, there'll be a, a thing at the bottom for Master for iTunes, and you can click on that, and you get all the releases that have been delivered in that format. And they all sound really good. You know, they sound, it's, 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 a, it's a big step in the right direction um, in terms of, in terms of quality, but as I say, the the catalog is still quite limited. Does that does that help? <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. It does. I mean, if you go to the Loft Mastering website, there's a lot more information about it and about how we prepare for it. And um, you can get that link to your uh, posting in the future too on the um, Pensado page. So, sorry, say again. We got to get that link to your uh, the post you're going to do in the future. That's going to go up this week, where we, which is Tuesday, isn't it? Today? Yeah, it'll be up by the end of the week, I think. So. Got to post that in Pensado students, he's saying. The, um, I have a question for you. Once, once you started learning about mastering, how did that affect your mixing? What did you do to the individual tracks differently once you started gaining mastering knowledge? Um, that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, you. I wouldn't say that my process of mixing changed that much. I'd say I'm probably fi I probably started fixing issues earlier on in the mix because I was more aware of what would have to be done later on. So I probably um, I probably did less less processing on my mix bus. And basically, the problem, if I was hearing problems in the mix, I was less inclined to jump on the mix bus and EQ it. So I'd go back to work out where the problem was coming from in the mix and solve it at source. What type of problems did you notice that you were addressing? You started addressing? Well, say, let's say, for instance, um, I've got my mix up and there's something like a little bit woolly, sort of in that sort of 400 hertz area. Like, Maybe before I was mastering, I'd probably be a bit too quick to jump on the mix bus and EQ that 400 just out of everything. Whereas instead of actually taking a step back and going, okay, where is that coming from, that problem? And it might just be in the vocals, you know, or something like that. So, Or it might be in just the bass guitar or something. So it's just a case of, I think I was starting to address things earlier on in the mix because I was aware of what would have to be done at mastering and you've got to remember that the mastering stage can be a bit of a compromise you know especially on a stereo file you're EQing 
a whole stereo file where the problem might only be in one element of that that mix, you know. So what you don't want to do, you don't want to be taking that 400 out of something that sounds fine, you know. Yep. When I started um, playing around with uh, mastering, um, one of the first things I did was start looking at my sub mixes, like all Vox or all my keyboards when they got submixed together. I started mm -hmm. looking at those as master faders. Um, yeah, yeah. And so is, that's that's also how you do it. And if so, what do you do on your um, sub mixes? How did that affect your sub mixes? The, the whole thought well, of ma the mastering knowledge. See, this is the beauty of like um, mixing in the box, isn't it? Like I I adopted mixing in the box fairly early, although I was still using I was still stemming stuff out into like um, into a summing mixer for quite a long time. Um, Nowadays, since moving to HDX, the 32-bit system um, for me has got enough headroom, and I've I've actually gone totally in the box now, with um, still using analog inserts and stuff like that. But I'm happy with the, the 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 sound of the mix, the actual mixer in Pro Tools now. Whereas before HD came out in 24-bit, it wasn't great, you know. So, um, but the, what I was going to say is that the beauty of of the way we can work now with the, with those sort of stems, you're almost stem stem mixing at the same time. So you've got your mix right. there, then you've got your stem mix, and then you've got your your, your two bus or whatever. So, um, just being able to just throw an EQ over one of those stems or something like that, we didn't have those options on the bit on you know the SSLs or the Neves. We didn't really have enough. We didn't have a, a, enough um, stereo buses to be able to to do that, you know. Uh, I mean, I think we had on the six thousand on the SSL six thousand, you could get three. I think we had three, but you know, and a lot of people obviously still use them. But the beauty of the way you're working and the way I'm working now is that we can have as many of those those sort of groups as we want. We can be putting EQs on them and compressors, and and it just opens up a whole new world of control, you know. Um, Come on, real quick, uh, Dwayne, are you saying that Andrew has a question? Uh, I'm saying that um, there was a previous question that was... We missed one? Oh, he, he answered it. It's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Although I do have a question now. Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. Um, <laughs> you, you, know, you, <laughs> you know you were saying about um, you like the sound of Pro Tools now um, with the HDX system. Mm. Um, I see online a lot of people saying that different doors have like a different sound. Do you yeah. find this as well? And do you find you... Self using different doors for maybe different tracks, so between no. genres, not at all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, totally, I totally agree with you that they do sound different. Um, even Logic, um, running through a Pro Tools hardware sounds different than Pro Tools software. But I've been pretty much just on Pro Tools now for a long time, um, so I don't really tend to use any other workstations um, for mixing. Um, so I can't really compare nowadays, but I'd say yeah, they do sound different. And also, what I've noticed is that, um, like for mastering, um, although I do start mastering jobs in Pro Tools, we then transfer over to um, Soundblade, um, right. Sonic, well, Sonic Solutions or Sonic, whatever it is nowadays. Um, and for to my ears, uh, they there there's elements of that software that sound better than Pro Tools as well. Especially in the dither, the dither sounds incredible in that sound blade. You know, it's like S sound blade, aren't they? Yeah. So I finished my mastering jobs in in that. It just it's the best sounding audio software that I've come across. So if you're doing, I think you can even do multi track stuff in there as well. I'm not I don't know how limited it would be, but for for two for two you know for stereo stuff, um, it sounds absolutely incredible. But the thing about the HDX, um. The 30, as soon as Avid went with the 32-bit thing um, and HDX, the, there was a, for me, there was a massive difference in headroom and what you can get away with. And it's almost like I'm a lot less worried nowadays about clipping and in mixing as well. Not so much in mastering, it's a bit more important. But in mixing, I'm really not so worried about seeing stuff clipping anymore in plugins and in the, in the mixer because sometimes it sounds better. It's like, yeah, yeah, and I found that if I notice stuff and I try and back it off, sometimes it just doesn't sound as good. 
There's a whole um, Dave did an ITL about clipping being your friend in the digital domain. Um, you should check it out if you haven't seen it. It's really good. I'll have a look um, at that, and I, I can, yeah, I mean, I can definitely vouch for that. I mean, I, I really not. This is the beauty of where we're at now is that we, I really don't have to worry about stuff like that anymore. You know, obviously there's a, there's an element of like I always start mixes with that sort of gain stage and thing of making sure stuff's not clipping, obviously, but it's almost like when stuff just in that HGX system stuff sort of starts sounding more energetic and stuff when you when you push it a little bit yeah um, and yeah I mean you know it goes against what we what we grew up being told we couldn't do but at the end of the day it's what comes out the speakers so yeah. <laughs> Ryan Keith in Tulare California you are vindicated when you said recording hot and clipping has a sound that you like you now have a mastering engineer you have me, even Dave has said it. Clipping going in the red is not so bad, and yes, there's a different sound, and we can like it. Um, I got to. Bear in mind, I did. Subject at times, I did, bro. <laughs> I did actually say though that it's it's a bit more important in mastering to make sure that um, you're not clipping things, but in, I'm talking about mixing really rather than the mastering. But you know, it just. Just go. I just go with my ears, but I've always done that. When even when we were on analog desks, you know, you'd see meters slamming and lights firing up everywhere and stuff. And I used to get a bit worried about that when I started, and then really I just started not worrying about it because it sounded great, you know. And then we, and now we're at that that point with the digital that actually it sort of works a little bit like that in digital now as well, you know. We we've had a long discussion in um Pensado students or a re repeated discussion where. Um, we talk about recording low, like negative 18 dBFS or negative 12, um, and I would constantly say, well, I record through plugins, right? But I would constantly say um, that I like the sound of recording at, say, I, I would record, I would set up an Oxen Pro Tools, record through it, and put a limiter, put compression and a limiter on there, and set the limiter's output to negative 3 dBFS, and I liked that sound. Mm -hmm. um, and and the guys were saying no, that's wrong, blah 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 blah, right? So um, I was over Brian Keith's house um, not too long ago, and he was in the red as we were recording. Yeah, I, I liked the sound. I liked what I was hearing, but I was like, something's wrong. Hold on. And he, yeah. the, the sound was. I mean, he was red, red, not just touching like barely. No, he was red. Yeah. And, um, so we did an experiment where I recorded. A vocal at negative 12 and the vocal um, up at negative 1 or 2 dBFS. Mm -hmm. And I liked, it's the same exact vocal. I mm -hmm. liked the one up at negative 1-ish um, dBFS. And what it was was the one recorded at negative 12 dBFS had everything alive. Like all the, say, a frequency at one kilohertz, around one kilohertz, the frequency around one kilohertz jumping. I heard and felt the transient of all these different frequencies. Mm. At, that's at the negative 12. Um, yeah. When the one that was recorded hot, those frequencies were calmed down. Yeah. I, and, and so I go in there constantly, I'm calming down different frequencies. Uh, when he recorded it hot, I didn't have to calm them down so much. And that yeah, was yeah. the difference. So, well, you know what? I mean, this, this is... Um... The beauty of what we all do is there is no rules, you know, as you're saying, it's like, what rules, you know what I mean, who said that we have to do this or what, you know, maybe when when the BBC started uh, training their, their engineers in the 1950s or something, they'd have a clipboard saying, you must do this, must do that, it's what sounds, it's the sound you're going for and how to achieve it, isn't it, and you, what you're saying is like, um, we used to do, <laughs> when I first started assisting, like we had, um, we were on, we were on DAT machines at the time. That was uh, that was the ma the mastering format. Um, and I seen a guy come in, a producer, and he was he was actually just tracking uh, for dem demos mm -hmm. um, of the of a band. And what he what we did, I I set up the DAT machine for him so it wasn't clipping as he printed his thing. And basically, he just slammed the input of the DAT machine so that it was just basically compressing to DAT. Uh, and it don't get me wrong, it sounded crunchy, but it was like a little, it was a punk band anyway, so it mm -hmm. sort of worked. And what he was doing, he knew that that machine was going to go to the label for approval for that mm -hmm. job, and then he could go and actually make the record. So he basically wanted to just get it really 
aggressive and, and punchy and loud and all that, but he didn't have the option of mastering at that point because it was going straight to the label. So that was that was quite a powerful lesson for me, having been told, oh, I've got to make sure that I, I, I set it so it doesn't clip for the for the client. And then he just goes and slams it, you know, and it's like, okay, right, there's definitely no rules here, is there, you know? And some of the, right, some of the guys in the group um, just yesterday um, posted that they'd like to learn more about compression. So um, what I'd like to ask is what can these guys do to where they hear the attack release, um, to where they hear when they adjust the settings, they hear it? Wow. Um. I mean, the way that I'd say the best way for the way I learned about compression is to use the equipment and just experiment, you know. And again, the, no rules whatsoever, you know. And it's like you can do what the hell you want. Mess with just I just mess with equipment and work out, you know, what's going on. I mean, one thing I would say is that unless the monitoring, unless your monitoring is fairly acceptable, you, you may not hear much difference. You know, if you're listening on crappy speakers, there's a chance that you're not going to hear. So, if you if you can try and get some half decent monitors, so you can actually hear what the attack and the release of the compression is doing. Um, but aside from that, I'd just say like just just experiment and work out. You know, I mean, and every day, I, you know, every time I set up a compressor, I, I'm I'm trying things that I, you know, I try it. What I try and do is I try not to get in my own. Um, sort of day to day, same, same, same. So even though I sort of know what probably is probably going to work, I still just try some odd things just every now and again, just to just to see. And sometimes it's like, oh, that's that's interesting. I'll use that, you know, whatever. But um, what about yeah, low I, ratio compression? Do you use low ratio compression a lot? Yeah. How low? I use, um, What's the lowest you go? Well, one to one is the lowest I go. I mean, you, you sometimes you, well, sometimes you want a compress. You don't want a comp you don't want to use a compressor for the compression. Sometimes you just want it for the character that it adds to the the audio. Gotcha. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of the time, especially in mastering, like a lot of the time, my meters that on the 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 game induction meters don't really move sometimes, but it's adding a character to that. To, do you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. sort of um, so yeah. I mean, but saying that in mixing the ratios, you can I can use high ratios all the time. It just depends what's what's required really. Again, just use your ears. You know, that's what I'd say to anyone is like, don't be afraid to try things because sometimes as well, like you'll you might look at I don't know, say a mix bus compressor and it's like slamming and okay, you've got to flag that and go, well, what does it sound like when it's not slamming? But don't be afraid to use it like that if, if it's the sound that you want. So, again, no rules, you know. Do you ever put anything in front of, like when you have a compressor being slammed like that on the mix bus, do you ever put anything in front of it, like another dynamic device, another a limiter compressor or something to take off um, some of the pressure being put onto that one or no? Well, per I don't personally tend to slam a mix bus compression, but... Um, <laughs> But I'm not saying that you shouldn't try it, you know. And if you if you happen to just glance over and it's slamming, but you're loving what you hear, then you know maybe there's not so much reason to worry about it. But personally, I tend to, if I'm doing anything like that, any drastic compression, I'll do it in my mix rather than on the mix bus. So maybe on one of the stems that you're talking about, you know, maybe on the group or something, and then keep. I wouldn't really do that on the mix bus as such. Roger that. <laughs> okay, somebody now somebody has a question for you. That would be me, uh, as I am leaving in a few minutes. Uh, thanks for your time, Mike. Really, no really worries. Thanks for coming out. No um, worries. And my question is, you touched on this a little bit with the monitors, but I wanted to know about headphones. Um, yeah. Do you have your go-to set? And I know you travel from studio to studio not as much, but do you bring your own pair or you just use what's um, there? Yeah, I'll, if I go somewhere else, I'll. If I go somewhere else, I'll take a few pairs actually. Um, but as I say, like I very rarely work elsewhere nowadays. I'm always I'm always in this room, so I don't work on headphones as much as I used to. Um, you check but, at least. 
while Sorry? you're going to check using headphones, and which ones do you use? Um, you know what? I, there's a lot of the time I don't listen on headphones as much now, but it's because since, I think since I got the barefoots, I, I trust them a lot more than I had Genelex before, and um, I, you know I knew them very well, but I always felt like I needed to listen on more different systems. But the barefoots are just um, the they've just got a real honesty to them and if there's a problem it tends to jump out on them so um, I don't tend to do headphone mixing as much as I used to but I've got um, just trying to think what I use now. they're not like particularly fancy ones like Bayer 770 DT 770s um, and I've also got some DJ headphones like um, Sony Sony DJ headphones so nothing spectacular but I mean these sound like really hard sounding and like super loud so if my high mids are wrong or um, if something's a bit brittle or, or bright you'll notice straight away on them so I think it's just having a, a choices like a few different combinations of you know there's no harm in having three sets of headphones and the iPod ones I use um, I've got some that I use for running as well uh, I think they're Sennheisers like the wraparound ones um, and a lot of the time, I'll just I'll just actually put something on my iPod and go for a run with that with them. So um, yeah, just a mixture, mix it up, you know, just get as many little systems as you can, I guess. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> what headphones are you using there? What headphones are you using? Well, the range running out of time, so we were, oh. we were going to let him just run with it because he's got to go. <laughs> These are Audio Technica H A T H N fifties. And you mix on them quite a lot. Uh, yeah, I mix on these quite a lot. I have a pair of um, Urban Ears that I like, uh, the gray ones. And I also have a pair of Sonys. I have that same Sony DJ one. And uh, hold on. <laughs> I have these Sonys. I try to get stuff that I see people wearing on the street. Yeah. And I, I have a pair too. of these ones. They have like a yeah. red on one side. I have yeah. the DJ ones, and the I have the new iPod earphones, the old iPod earphones. I actually bought, I have two of each <laughs> because yeah. I burned through them so quickly. Great, man. I mean, one thing I'd say about the, the headphones is it takes the room out, out of the equation, doesn't it? You know, So wherever you are, you've got that consistency uh, of, of taking the acoustics out, out, of the, um, out of the picture, which you know can't, can't be a bad thing. So... Definitely endorse it. It's just I don't tend to do as much of it as I as I used to. Like, but thanks guys for letting me run on for so long. Uh, no worries, really for having me. So uh, good day to you all. Good seeing you, man. Peace out, bro. Yeah. We keep hearing uh, a multiband compression get beat up. Um, and and I remember back in the day that was one of the secret tools of the mastering engineers. Like, ooh. Um, and then once we started. Using it once we had access to it, um, we would hear, "Oh no, don't touch it! It's a sin if you use it." Um, how are you using multiband compression? Okay, um, I don't use a lot of multiband compression. Um, the reason I don't do that, it, it, are we talking about mixing or mastering? Either one. Either one. Okay, let's talk about mixing first, because if I'm mixing and I've got um, I guess the idea of multiband compression is to solve pro problems in different areas, isn't it? I guess that's what we're talking about. So if, I mean, obviously it can do a job of solving something um, in a mix, and sometimes I will use it, and it's it'll be really subtly, you know, you might just get 1 dB, 2 dB of compression or something. But the way I see it is that if there is some, if, if the multiband is working in a certain area quite a lot, then I always think let's take a step back in the chain and work out why it means there's something wrong with the mix. If, if say for instance, the low mid of the multiband is slamming and, and the rest of it's fine, then it's like, okay, where's that energy coming from in the mix that doesn't need to be there and fix it earlier in the chain? Um, now, obviously, at the mastering stage, I don't have that. I don't always have that luxury if I haven't mixed the, the project. Um, so then it becomes more of a, a problem-solving tool than, um, than than the mix situation, you know. So 
a lot of the stuff that comes in purely for mastering, especially this, just the stereo files where I don't get access to the stems or the a cappella or whatever, um, the multiband can be quite useful just to, to to solve problems, you know. But then again, I think I'd probably reach for like notch filters and stuff first before um, if there's a, if there's a serious issue, I'd probably try and try and really hone in on that thing rather than the global sort of three bands or whatever. Um, Do you ever use multiband compression creatively, like in a mix, sound design type stuff? Yeah. I mean, if that, I'd probably use it more in that situation. Like, um, I don't know, things like overheads quite useful. Um, what do you do with overheads? Like what? Just like for on, to put multiband on overheads and just actually get the energy out of them without the harsh symbols and things like that. Although saying that nowadays, I probably use the suppressor more than than that. But it can impart a certain amount of energy um, on something like that, where you've got you know you might not want certain bands as strong as others, but I mean, I don't know, I'm trying to think of, I haven't used multiband on a on a mix for a while, so I'm just trying to think of those situations, overheads could be useful, anything, I don't know, I mean, I just think single band compression is, is if, the, if, what, if the source is, it, it, is captured in the right way, it shouldn't, I don't know if it should need multiband as much, I don't know. I think of it more as a problem-solving tool, or just maybe just a, a bit of a gloss on a on a mix bus or something. You know, just a real tiny amount of compression, maybe one dB or something, where it's just it's just like a little bit of sheen on there. But sometimes you might not want that sheen, you know. So again, it's it's down to approaching each job on its own merits and working out if it's appropriate for that particular song or or whatever. And how loud are you mixing? Um, how loud are you mastering? How loud are you mixing? Oh, mastering. Sorry, say again. How loud are you mastering? How loud are you mixing? SPL level type stuff. In mastering sessions. Okay, mastering sessions. How loud are you um, mastering? How loud um, is the level? I'll have moments where I'll turn up the speakers if if um if I want to you know if I want to sort of work out the energy uh, the low end and a lot of the time on especially on these barefoots, if the if you turn them up and it really takes your head off, you'll the the high mids, in fact all the mids are, are quite forward. So um sometimes you might not notice something being harsh until you turn it up a little bit. I guess that would apply to most monitors really. So sometimes if you're listening at low level, you can think something's fine and then you turn it up. I like to be able to turn speakers up and for it to not sort of take my head off, you know? And I think that's a good judge for me of whether the mids are, are, are right. Um, but I won't do it for any length of time, really. I'll just, you know, I'll be EQing stuff a bit more, a bit quieter. And then that's my sort of, I can sign it off. If I know I can crank it up and I can sit there and enjoy it rather than it being a bit like, oh, that hurts, then that for me is, is the sign that, it, that it's working, you know. Um, but I wouldn't do it for any length of time because then it's sort of, the next thing you do, your ears are gone, you know. So, um, right. But I would, but I do think I do, I do think for in my the way I work, I do like to be able to just turn it up now and again and make sure that it works at that level. Mixing our mastering, really. I'm asking because you you know you'll see. Well, if you see any videos on my page, the guys are always blasting the music, not just when they're making it, sitting there mixing, and the music is just killer loud. Um, yeah. And I have to actually force them to turn it down to a whisper um, yeah. to listen to it. Um, so, I, so I keep asking people as we do these, um, I'm going to keep asking people, okay, what level do you mix at to kind of yeah. bring it home to the fellas that, hey, you guys need to turn this stuff down? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's different in the right, at the writing and production stage. It's different there because you want vibe, don't you? So especially when you've got people performing and um, I can understand that, you know, it makes a difference and, you know, sometimes if you've got clients here to approve things, they want to hear it loud and, you know, that's fine. Usually I'll just turn the speakers up and run out the studio and let them. <laughs> I was just about in. to ask, how do you compensate do for that? Well. Yeah. <laughs> or or I, might, I might actually wear filters as well sometimes. Like, um, I've got, tomorrow I'm actually working on a project for the World Cup um, for Fat Boy Slim's record and we've got, a, we've got um, some Samba drummers coming in. 
Mm-hmm. So um, it's one of the few recording projects that I'm sort of getting involved with at the moment. Um, and that's going to be loud. So I'll, I'll probably be wearing filters for most of tomorrow. But, um, but you know, it's as I say, like at that recording stage, it, it's it's sort of important to to just have, make sure people are vibed up. And if that means they want to hear stuff loud, then, you know, so be able you've got to work out a way of sort of being able to save your own ears during that process, you know. Now, real quick, you, your accent, where are you from again? Liverpool. Huh? Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now watch this. Say HDX. HDX. That's not what you were saying earlier. No, nah, not it? your way. Not, uh, no, don't say it our <laughs> way. <laughs> I think we're I'm fine. We're, we're English, man, so we write our own language. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Huh? HDX. Every HDX. time you would say HDX, it was throwing me off. I'm, uh, like like um, when I would hear people say Henri, or Henri, uh, like you guys say it instead of Henry. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Every time you were saying it, it was throwing me off. And we have a guy named Track Slasher who comes on. Um, he's Trinidad, Bill. Yep, Trinidad. Yep. Mm-hmm. He's from Trinidad, and and um, some we, we we like messing with him about um his his uh, accent. We love it. The we we forget sometimes that we're Pensado students is global. So yeah, yeah. Like right now, when we started, it was six a.m. where I was. Yeah, um, man. Respect. Yeah. And well, Bill doesn't sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, we'll, we'll be doing Never that. <laughs> yeah, it's time for some people to go to bed while other people are, are waking up. Um, but we just we forget that we're international and, yeah. and we're, on, we're in all these different time zones. And um, like when we're typing, um, we all have these different, you know, the way we type. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll be typing words and I'm not realizing that you guys are not understanding because I'm using some local lingo. Yeah. <laughs> slang. You guys might be sitting there like, what the hell is this man? You know what? Never mind. I'm not even gonna read that. You know. You know what's yeah. funny, like as as I've sort of um as I've sort of developed through my career and started working with people outside of Liverpool over over the years, it's like I've had to tame my accents a little bit because you just end up repeating yourself all the time. Right, okay. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> so Same, just man. consciously you just slow yourself down and you start sort of Trying to make a bit more sense in the first the first time you say something, and it saves right. a lot of messing about, you know. And it also matters with time zones. You know, I, I haven't. It's 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 funny to me now because I've been doing the social media thing pretty tough since 2006. So mm. I haven't been local for years. <laughs> so you know what I'm saying. So there is no like somebody said um, on one in one situation. He was like, "Hey man, you should do these hangouts." you know, when I can watch them, which is after I get out of work. And I'm like, look, man, we're worldwide. There is no <laughs> after work. <laughs> you know, like, after work for you is before work for somebody else and during work for somebody else. So that's what we have to say. We have to say, all right, we're going to get together 6 a.m. Cali, 9 a.m. New York, 2 p.m. England. That's how we're doing it. <laughs> that's it, man. That's impressive. I mean, I think one thing I'd say, like, I, I think as a probably – I probably got a lot more into mixing maybe like, oh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. Uh, and before that, I was doing a hell of a lot more recording. And I think the recording projects, you can stay and work for longer and it not be as much of a problem. But when you for me, when I'm mixing, I think beyond a 12-hour day, say, for instance, I think you you really can't trust your ears to make crucial judgments, you know. And I think... Um, I think since I've started mixing a lot more, you, you have to really sort of map your day out a little bit more um, sensibly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you just, you know, I, I might be just, you know, some other people might not have a problem with it, but I think I think most people will agree that you really have to, you have to be careful what decisions you make after 12 hours of listening to to sure. projects and sometimes you have to make you know if you've got a meter deadline sometimes you have to make those decisions and that's where referencing comes in really useful and, and quiet monitoring you know you can by the end of the day if I'm not sure of something I'll just put a few records on and just uh, reset my <laughs> <I'm> still hearing <laughs> properly <laughs> yeah yeah well as I say when we were record years ago recording we I'd worked for you know 72 hours without sleep and You'd sort of get by, but I couldn't. I couldn't do that mixing. Like, wow. how much are you protecting <laughs> your ears um, after work? 
So, sorry, Matt. Say again. How much are you protecting your ears after work? Like, like after work, are you like putting in earplugs or just telling everybody to shut up? Are you going to a quiet place and relaxing? Quiet place, relaxing, yeah. Um, or if I have to go to a gig or if I'm out with friends or whatever, I wear filters when I'm out as well. If I'm in a club environment, always, always, always filters. And what you know, they're great now. Say again. What filters are you using, Mike? Do you know what? I'm not actually sure, but they're from. Um, I could find out for you. I'm just That'd not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what they're called, but they've they're just molds with um with an attenuator in them. You can take the attenuator out and change it. I think I've got 15 and 25 dB attenuators, and you can swap them out. Um, but you know they're getting really good now, where you can I can go and watch a gig and. I can put them in and I can still hear. In fact, it's almost like you can hear more detail with them in. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a PA with a lot of distortion and um, cranked up loud, if you put them in, you can almost hear every, the details a lot more with them in. Um, so, yeah, I'll definitely vouch for them. I'll find out for you because I got, them, I got them here in Liverpool. You can, you know, Great. they're available. I use, I use these very expensive, expensive filters. The brand name is Bar Napkins. <laughs> <laughs> That's a so German company, it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, German bottle napkins. Yeah, there's bottle napkins. Properly, <laughs> but bottle napkins. What happens is I'm standing there and somebody fires up their amp and it goes squeal and I go oh. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that has been known as well. You know, I don't always remember my filters, but um, right. <laughs> so business is business. <laughs> Yeah, by whichever means necessary, you know. That's right. I'm, That's right. I'm actually surprised how like some guys who are still in the game or mixing at like you know, 50, 60 years old have been doing stuff at such loudness that they can still mix really well. Like I did um, my dissertation at university on like hearing loss and engineers. I did like a uh, survey on gear slots. I found loads of people had like tinnitus, but just didn't care and didn't want to do anything about it because they thought, well, it's happened now, so I'll just carry on doing what I'm doing. It's really a bit weird that, you know, to try to protect your ears as much as possible because it's your livelihood at the end of the day. Well, it is, isn't it? I mean, you know, I think as if you were strictly a recording engineer, I'd say it's less important, although, you know, still, I don't know, still crucial, really, but maybe less important than if you're mixing and mastering, but I don't know, as you say, it's, a, it's our livelihood, isn't it? You know, without that, we're nowhere, so... Yeah. That as much as we can, you know. Even, you know, any loud environments really. And sometimes, if like, even if I want, if I pop out for an air break, even just if I just want a bit of silence, but at the same time I want to go out, go to a coffee shop, I'll put my filters in there, hmm. and ju you know, at least I just get a little bit of nice quiet just for twenty minutes. You may have gone over this already when you were talking about SPL, but uh, is there a particular uh, level that you like to output at so as to avoid undersample peaks? No, because I'll tell you why, I've heard a lot of people talking about this recently, and I always trust my ears over what meters tell me, always. Um, and I might be wrong in saying that, I don't know, some people might kill me for that one, but really, it's just all about what, I, what my ears tell me, for me, and, you know, even at the mastering stage, you can break rules, you know, and people do every day, but... Um, it's for it's it's what's suitable for that particular project, um, uh, and I think you've just got to you've got to address each job on its own merits as it comes in. But I think more often than not, like perceived if we're talking about like perceived loudness and stuff like that, I'll A B quite a lot. But I won't be looking at meters while I'm doing that. I'll just A B for overall um, impact and what that you know the impression I get from something rather than you know, what's that meter saying sort of thing. Uh, they're a good meters are a good guideline, you know, because I'm not saying you don't need them. You, they're there for a reason, but I'm just saying that my final decision making is based on my ears rather than meters. On, on the intersample peaks, um, I had a mix-up, and um, I had, I think it's TL meter um, in Pro Tools. It shows uh -huh. the inter intersample peaks. I put that thing on, and I was shocked at how low I had to go without it, without yeah. a, a brick wall limiter on to keep from getting yeah. the overs. Yeah. Um, I, I had no idea that um, you could have a, like, people just have to try it. 
you, you insert till um, those who have a, a meter that shows inner sample peaks, put mm -hmm. it on, and then see how low you have to go to in, when you, on your mix to get it to where you do not get overs. Just mm -hmm. give it a shot. You, you might be shocked. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, you might be shocked that um, if you import some of your CDs from your record collection into Pro Tools or into whatever workstation you use and look at how hot some of it is and how distorted a lot of it is and yeah you could say the same there you'd be shocked you know at, at what people do but it's what's appropriate for that particular project at that time that it was done you know and, and that's another thing we had got into about converting it off a of CD in, into um, Pro Tools that conversion um, I, I'd go back, um, Dr. Dre, I was listening to Dr. Dre, and then there was one um, song by The Roots, uh, Don't yeah. Say Nothing, but whatever, this this thing yeah. was um, 8 yeah. RMS, yeah. and I was loving it. I, I was sitting there like, wow, what is it that they've done to this? And, and when I went and checked it, it was <laughs> 8 RMS, it. and I was like, this is what I like? And everybody was saying how bad it would be if you had it, you know, at somewhere yeah, around yeah. 8 RMS, bruh. I'm lo I was loving that. I'm like, okay, we all have different understandings of what's good. This um, is the thing, isn't it? That's just why. This is why I say, like, you've got to approach each job on its own merits. And you know, you listen to a lot of those Roots records. It's like they, that distortion adds to it. You know, it adds to the yeah. excitement and the energy and stuff like that. And without it, it just sounds a little bit tame. Yeah. So, but you, you know, the way you'd approach mastering the Roots is is very different than you know, like a an orchestral record or, you know, it's right. just. You just got. To... I realized that um, people might not know what we're talking about in sample peaks, and basically, what we're talking about. <laughs> but basically, what we're talking about is that at in digital music, it's actually being sampled. So if it's forty-four point one kilohertz, it's being sampled forty-four thousand one hundred times per second. Forty-eight kilohertz is being sampled forty-eight thousand times per second. So they're actually discrete instances of samples. So if you were to translate that back into an analog waveform, it's not really going point, point, point. There's stuff happening in between these two points, and it might be going like this. So if you have, if you look on a digital meter, and the digital meter is saying, oh, I'm peaking at point, uh, at minus 0.1 dBFS, then you might actually be going over in between those when you actually output your file. So that's what mm -hmm. we're talking about is whether or not he does something to avoid that situation happening. All right. Cool. Okay, you just confused Cheers, me. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> you're gonna have to <laughs> you're gonna have to go read the Sonox limiter manual. I'll I'll post it. <laughs> in page thirteen. It explains the whole thing. <laughs> no, I, I I ran in um, from work from camera. I, I thought it was garbage at first. Um, well, first back to Dr. Dre. I'm importing Dr. Dre samples. I'm I'm um, off of a CD to do a, a reference as a, as a mix, and um, I had an MP3 from somewhere and of Dr. Dre, and that thing was in the red, but sounding good, you know, like which goes back to where we're talking about trusting our ears. Um, mm. But then I would notice that sometimes I would do things and it would sound good, but I'd play it on certain little radios, and it would distort um, yeah. when it, when I'd burn it on onto a say a CD, and what I found. Um, I forget what there. There's something out there we've posted several times at Pensado students where it talked about that where your stuff is so hot that uh, that when say the CD player is converting it to analog, um, that that conversion causes stuff to distort. There's all kinds of stuff to um, catch us off guard, which Mark. is why I'm glad we do have master and engineers uh, yeah. so that you guys, whatever it is, you guys catch it for us. Yeah, Matt, did you did you get a chance to hear that that Dre track? From a, a CD or a WAV rather than the MP3. Um, I liked both, but what the the, MP, the CD was clearer. The CD because what, was. One of the, you just reminded me actually. There was someone asked me a question on on the group that I didn't get a chance to reply to. So I, I'll do that, but I'll also talk about it now quickly. Is that he was asking about um, why uh, about MP3 converting MP3s from a WAV? What's the best way? Um, and I was. I answered the question with just talking about the difference in in sound from different codecs and different pieces of software sound different, but also something that a lot of people don't realize is that that 
um, that process is actually adding level as well. So when you convert a WAV to a MP3, you might get another half dB of level. Now, if that WAV is already at naught, the only way it's got, it can go is into distortion. So one of the things I said to him is that if you're going to convert WAVs to MP3, turn it down slightly first. Turn the WAV down. It might, to be safe, I'd say a dB, but you might get away with a little bit less than that. And then when you convert to the MP3, it will stay under 0 dB and you won't get that added distortion. So I think what you're saying about the Dre record, the reason possibly why that MP3 sounded more distorted is because it was already at naught in the WAV and it's just gone, it's just added that extra bit of distortion uh, when, when someone's converted it. When I was using SoundForge, um, I was a SoundForge junkie for a while when I was trying to figure out um, stuff about mastering and I would mm. have to actually bounce my waves out at negative 0.7 dBFS yeah. and when I would yeah. do that, when it would get converted into an MP3, I was fine. I mean, I actually went negative point six. Okay, negative point seven. Ah, good. Um, which I now a lot of guys I know print at their mixes at negative point three. I print mine at negative point five. Yeah. Which some people say, "Oh, you're losing, man." I don't. Number one, I know how to get my mixes loud in the mix, not even on the master fader, mm. just in the mix. And number two. If somebody's really concerned about that 0.5 dB, we have an issue. Yeah. Exactly. Well, one thing. I agree. Yeah. What one of the um. Uh, what was I gonna? You just. I was just gonna say something then about what you're going on about. Um. The. It's totally. Ah, I know what I was gonna say about the. You sort of the 0 0.7 thing is actually quite a good place because uh, more often than not, um. That is is more than enough to 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 do it from my experience, and the, a good test of that is um. Have any of you guys used the the Pro Codec plugin from no. Sonox? No. Now there's other bits of software that do this, but I'm sure there will be, but I'm not sure what they are. But there's something in that plugin that will tell you the exact amount you need to turn down your WAV um to make sure that it hits naught and no more when you convert it and it'll be different for depending on what format you're going to convert to and what codec you're using it'll come up with a different trim value uh, and more often than not I found it to be a, around 0.43 or 0.57 or do you know I mean it's it's all it's quite an accurate thing and I'd always go a little bit beyond it but it does it automatically for you so if you get a chance to, to look at that it's quite interesting to see which codecs need trimming by what amount and stuff like that. Bit cool. geeky. <laughs> I, just, I just figured out you're not saying north, you're saying not, which is zero. That's what you're saying. I'm like north, you know, all the way to north, like the North Pole. What is he talking um, about? Yeah, sorry, okay, I apologize to these Americans, Mike. They don't, right. they don't understand this. <laughs> Mind us, Yanks. Carry on. <laughs> we we right. let you go 200 years ago. You know, forgot about. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> it was like throw out these things, not. We don't need that. <laughs> Um, I've got a question if I can jump in, guys. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the bands and stuff that I've worked with recently, they're making little EPs and they're getting put on SoundCloud. Um, the compression from SoundCloud, from what I heard, isn't it isn't great. No. Do you think not. it's still still worth mastering for for them to go onto there, or just leave yeah. it after the mix stage? Oh God, no! It's definitely worth mastering. But what see the, what we do as well at the ma at, when we're delivering formats um, after after mastering a project, there'll be different formats going to different places. So you'll have a CD, right. D DDP for CD, and that will go to the factory for for pressing. And then you'll also more often than not get asked for files for upload. So you might get asked for like uh, master for iTunes files. So they'll be like high definition, twenty four bit, um, and then. A lot of the time, people will say, "Oh, can you give me some WAVs to put on um, Beatport, or you know, to convert, or SoundCloud, or you know, whatever?" And I'll always trim those down. I don't know which converters that, which which codecs they'll be using. So I'll always trim them by a dB or something, just to, um, so they'll have a folder of of trimmed WAVs specifically right. for uploading to SoundCloud and and their Facebook or whatever they want to do with them. Um, and that'll make sure that, that at least, even though the SoundCloud codec is terrible, at least it won't add distortion from the WAV, you know. Right. Um, but you definitely, 
I'd say definitely worth mastering because you've got to remember that any codec will react to the quality of what you're putting into it. So yeah. if, if you put something substandard in, it's only going to get worse. So if you, if you keep the quality as high as you can at every stage, then it's going to make for a better MP3 at the end, isn't it? No, good point, man, good point. Um, so have you ever, has someone ever come to you with a project, I imagine you're working at a much higher level than I am right now, and said so this is going to go onto SoundCloud, would you ever master for that as well? Will you like listen back to other stuff on that codex and go, right, this is doing this to the base and this, so I'll have to tweak this and, like these areas? Or do you just um, do what you're saying there? Well, the, be the beauty of that Pro Codec plugin is you can actually monitor through it in yeah. real time. And you can set it to whichever compressed format you want. So I could set it to like a real crappy MP3 setting and put it on my mix bus and I can actually be mixing into it so I can hear what it's going to sound like. Is that what you... Yeah, that yeah, you know? just, yeah, yeah, it's just... Yeah, yeah, pretty much. But before, before, I've only actually... I've only actually owned that plugin for about a year, so before that I used to always reference from, so I'll, I'll print a mix and then I'll, I'll go and convert it to a crappy MP3 or whatever and listen to that on a few different systems, but that's quite time consuming as well. Yeah. Um, so that's the beauty of the Pro Codec thing is you can you can do it all in real time as you're mixing and it's not, um, you, know, you don't have to go through all that converting process of each mix and all that, so... Um, right, I'll have to check it out, man. A handy little tool, that definitely. There's a there's a new thing they just brought out. I don't know much about it, but I think it's just a standalone codec piece of software, and it uses the same processor as the as the plugin. And it's really it's not that expensive. I think it's like thirty thirty pounds or something. Is this for Sonox? It's only just come out, but I haven't had a chance to read about it. But I, from what I can gather, it's um it it could be a useful little cheap tool to be converting stuff through. Yeah, well, I'll um, check it out. Yeah, check it out. I say I, I haven't got any more info on it, but I just noticed it the other day that it's come up. Hey, Mike, how are you getting files um, transferred to you? Which What are the different ways that people are sending files to you? Um, there's quite a few different companies, isn't there, that, are, that have set up servers and clouds and things like that, and people tend to use different you know, a lot of, uh, what do they use, um, Dropbox and um, WeTransfer. Um, we, I have got an FTP server, but they're, they're just a pain. Those are, the FTPs are, especially for Mac users, you know, which is like a lot of artists are on Mac, and it, it's, um, it just overcomplicates things. So we don't use the FTP as much nowadays, and um, I use Hightail, uh, which used to be you send it, um, and you... The thing is, you've got to be careful because some of these, like I know the compression that Dropbox were using was a bit controversial up to recently, and I, I don't know what they've what they've done to sort it out. But um, yeah, I mean, ideally, I'd say for people to send drives in the post, you know, but send hard drives. Yeah, but to, just to, to avoid that that online compression and zipping and unzipping and stuff like that, but. It's just not practical for most of the time, you know. Um, okay, so wait, people would send it to you via Dropbox, and they would zip it. Oh no! Well, it does that automatically, doesn't it? So really, during that process of them sending files to you, it'll go onto the Dropbox. Uh, not necessarily Dropbox, but as a as a rule, you know, Hightail or whatever those companies are, they they'll use a certain. Compression. Well, yeah, Dropbox will not, but the other companies will. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, I can't remember if it was Dropbox, but one of the companies there was we had a problem with recently, and it wasn't stuff. You send it. It's like you send it or something. It's very popular. Yeah, but but this is something that it, obviously you've got to be aware of is that there is stuff happening to your files, and you've got to, you've got to weigh up whether that's affecting what you're hearing. You know, I mean, it's a lot better nowadays than some of the issues we used to have, but. Um, like still to this day now, I, I don't know if you guys use Pro Tools or Logic or whatever, but for me, um, the split stereo format um, is still sounding better to me than the stereo um, files. Um, it's a very, very subtle 
subjective thing, but for me, the the mono, um, yeah, dual mono. The the split stereo files just sound somehow uh, more solid. I, I don't know. What are you I doing think, to hear I this? I've never heard of that. I'm I'm gonna try that out. Yeah. What are you Same doing answer. to actually hear that? Say again. What are you doing to actually hear the that the split the dual mono um, A B uh, the split bounces are actually whatever better just A B A B the two so I can't explain it I don't know why um, and as I say like I'm no, I, I don't know if it's so much of an issue now as it used to be um, but I'm still hearing still hearing a difference, you know, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't be, I don't know, but... even with you trying to fool yourself? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but not all the time, depending on the, on the content, but I can't, there's some stuff about digital summing and digital, um, that I can't explain, and I think there's still, say for it, like this morning, I was, I was setting up a mix, and I had a kick drum that was sent to me in stereo, but it was obviously just a mono kick. And if I play back that stereo file and A B it with a mono print of that, the mono one sounds more coherent and solid than the stereo one. I don't know why. It shouldn't, but And you don't have to blast the volume to hear this, just regular listening volume you hear this? Well you have to match the levels obviously because the mono is going to be louder so once you once you match the levels again and listen to what just A B the two for me the the kick of coming from a mono file sounds more solid than the stereo kick. And w once you match the levels, you're not having to turn this stuff up real loud to listen to it. You just no. regular volume. You're hearing this, huh? Hear it quiet and loud as well. And wow. You know, it's it's really subtle. Don't get me wrong; it's not like a deal breaker if you have to mix something from stereo, but it's mono. But it, right. it's some, something in it, you know, and I can't dismiss it, which is a pain because, especially people that have prepped mixes for me in Logic, pretty much all the time it comes as everything stereo, um, because the, I think there's a setting in Logic that you can export the mono stuff as mono, but people don't tick that box usually, so. Everything comes as stereo, and then the, my assistant will have to sit through and, and listen through the, and work out what's mono, what's stereo, and then I'll get them to print. The, the stuff that's mono, I'll get them to reprint it as a mono file before I start. When you talk about these little things, I, I feel you, bro, because I, had, I caught hell with Dither in SoundForge. All the different options, I heard the difference. I heard transients being different. I heard... Low end, yeah. like some stuff sounded more analogy, like Glossian, uh, mm. sounded analogish. Um, whereas a tri high pass sounded real pristine with transit. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was very interesting. All the little details that I heard that was different. And there was something. There's something on the internet where these guys are all sitting at a table, um, denouncing, debunking all the audio myths. And when they got to that, dither doesn't matter. I just lost it. I went off in the group like, <laughs> these guys have lost their minds. I don't care who they are, what they say. I hear this. I caught hell with it. You know, to hell with you. These guys yeah. don't know what they're talking about. Well, at least on the dither. You know, yeah. So. <laughs> You're right. You're so right, Mike. You've got, I, keep, I say this all the time to people. It's like, always trust your ears over what a piece of kit is telling you or what a meter is telling you or, you know, because that's what matters. It's what you, it's, you know, computers are on... Maybe maybe the summit the digital summit is too perfect now. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe the 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 um the the variance in in the analog world is actually what we like as humans. You know, I don't know. And maybe maybe the summing is, is so so accurate and so exact that that's what we don't like about it. I don't know. But you know, the other thing I noticed talking on a similar sort of note with um with summing when I first started using summing boxes um, you know so I think most of them now will have like mono inputs and stereo inputs and it's the same thing with that if I fire a kick out of two converters into a stereo summon and then I fire the same kick through one converter a mono converter into the summing system the mono one sounds stronger to me 
than the one that's coming out of two converters. So I don't know. I, I can't explain it, but I just know what I, I prefer the sound of, you know. And, I may have uh, commented on the wrong end of the conversation when I came back to it. When you were saying mono versus stereo, you were talking about, let's say somebody has a kick track, and yeah. instead of outputting the kick track, which is mono, as mono, I mean, assuming they didn't put extra effects on it with, like, trigger yeah. or whatever, instead of outputting the kick track as mono, somehow they output it as stereo and send yeah. it for mixing. Yeah, so, that happened a lot. So yeah. what I was talking about was the output of Logic, like the actual two bus output. Have yeah. you heard any difference between? Because you have that option on the two bus for Logic, you can either output dual mono files or you can output interleaved audio, interleaved stereo. Well, I would, if someone gives me the option, I'd always ask for split stereo files gotcha. for, for for mastering stereo mixes. I'd always ask for split stereo. But as I said, it's it, it's not the end of the world, um, but it's just that in the past I've I've noticed the difference in the in how they sound, and sure. I just think the the, the split files just sound more coherent, and I don't know why. But and as far as um, a being not really meaning that, but meaning uh, reference tracks, like you had your uh, a b plugin up earlier. Uh, yeah, it's how, great. How how is it that you like to use reference tracks? Meaning. Um, Meaning, like, uh, you're not going to have... It, it, do you loop things, and do you say, all right, I'm going to loop a section that has a kick here and a kick here, and I'm going to compare the kicks, and then yeah. I'm going to put a guitar and guitar, or how, how do you use reference tracks? Well, um, well, firstly, I've only just bought that plugin about a month ago. Um, it's incredible and um, a massive time saver, but up till a month ago, what I used to do is, um, when I'd start a mix... I'd pick maybe up to ten tracks that would have some reference that I think is appropriate to that job. So it might just be like a kick sound, or it might be the vocal, or so I'd pick a handful of things, or it might be the overall mix that I like, or the overall loudness or something. So I'd then I'd just import them as tracks in the in the mix in the in the mix setup. Um, I'd mute them all, and then I'd be able to just jump in between an AB. I mean, on the on the D control, you can set up like custom faders where you can have them all there in front of you and just chop and change. Um, but as you say, they might not be at that particular point where you want them to be in the song. Right. So what I'd do is I'd line them up. So if if there's say if I really like like the verse vocal sound or something on one of the tr one of the refs. I'll line that up with my verse and song and stuff like that. But it is a bit it's a bit more time consuming, whereas on this plugin you can set up presets. Like at the moment I've what have I got on there? I've got a preset for a uh, male vocal. The, the track I'm working on at the moment's got a, a male vocal in. So I've picked like nine tracks that I like the vocal vocal sound on. Nice. And I've basically looped I've looped verse one on on all of those just to, while I'm working on on the verse of my track and I can just jump in between and then I can easily just change to I've got another preset stored for dr drums um, that are appropriate to this so it's just a lot faster you know and you can literally just flip in between and you know that it's always going to be at the right place in that track it's cool. just stroke of genius man I'm surprised no one's thought about, about that before I don't know how long it's been out for but it's I don't know it's, about it's, it's relatively reason. new yeah it's a couple months yeah brilliant but uh, and and what, like 30, 30 pounds or something? You know, it's just a no-brainer, like, brilliant. Yeah. Really good. Uh, it's all about workflow, isn't it, nowadays? Just trying to keep keep things moving, you know, and it's almost like, uh, for me, I only need to be distracted for, like, a minute or so doing something, and I've lost my flow a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the more things you can do to just keep it rolling and not have to think about something, the more creative you can keep you, your mind, you know? Speaking of that, do you like to use templates? Do you like to set th certain things up ahead of time? You're saying, okay, I've got my 250 here and my 140 here and my delay here, and I'm just going to yeah. have those ready for me so that whenever I want to mix, I just use that send? Yeah, but what what um, you can fall... I do have templates, but I think if you're not careful, you can fall into a bit of a trap where you mix every job in the same way because you've got the template there. So what I do, I have like my... 
I have a, I have a sort of um, a priority template which basically has all the stuff that I know I'm going to need, and that'll just be like um, that'll basically be like my subgroups and my VCAs. Um, I'm a mix bus print um, track and stuff like that. They're the things that you need in every job. So that would be my first import, and then I'd have like a load of sort of um, inactive tracks of like effects and different chains of things and stuff. And I won't have them active unless I actually choose to try one of them. But they'll just be at the end of my session, if, if you know what I mean. So I can call on them quite easily, but I don't actually have them open, ready to use, because I don't. I think that that leans your decision making. In in a certain way that I don't like. Okay, cool. And as far as the two bus, what you I guess based on what you were saying earlier, you wouldn't necessarily set up your two bus early in the mix because you'd want to see what serves the song and then decide what you wanted to put on yeah. after. Well, I want to try and I, I like to try and get the most out of my mix before I start working on the on the mix bus, if that makes sense. So I, I'll um. I'll almost hold back on on putting anything on the mix bus, um, and I'll just try and get every little last drop of energy out of the mix without anything. Um, but um, recently, I mean, I might have actually, I might have like an EQ across there with just um, like a high pass filter at 20 or 30 hertz or something. I might have that, but even then, I'd rather take. That low end stuff out of the multi track stuff than each individual, yeah. Yeah, but sometimes just for speed, I might just have that on just for a little bit and then come back to it, take it off again. But one, th one thing I've been using quite a lot is the UAD Ampex, um, the 102. 102, I use that too, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. What a great plugin that is. But I've been using it on the mix bus, but what I found is that. You have to put it on quite early if you're going to use that because yeah, because it does its own EQ and everything else, and it changes got a everything. Certain bump to it if you yep. use it a certain way, and I think if you try and put that on later, it fucks up all your settings from yep. earlier on. So that's one plugin that I be I do really like, but I found that it helps to have it on quite early um, and mix into it. But there's not many other plugins that I would mix into on the on the stereo bus really, apart from, from that's, that one. That's actually what I was about to ask ask you about is what do you what type of environment would you set up, or or like if you, like if I want an old school type feel, I might take some analog signature stuff, throw it on the master bus and mix through it. Um, I was about to ask you what type of stuff would you mix through to get a certain flavor that you you know you want in the end. Um, so that's about it, huh? It might be something like um, there's a, there's part of my mix. More often than not, there'll be um, some analog stuff on my, on my mix bus, um, and I might although I might not do too much early on. I might have something like um, I don't know if you can you see the Neves in the background. These yeah 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 we can see it from like an old 70s Neve console and the, nice. the line amps are great for just imparting a, you know like a lot of different types of kit as well it's not just those that, that do it but sometimes I'll just have the it running through the line amps of no EQ or anything like that but just just running through the line amps imparts a certain character that I'll, I don't mind putting that on quite early if you know mm -hmm. um, Aside from that, in terms of compression and EQ, I'd probably try and leave it a bit a bit longer. Um, oh. And what you're using is an icon. That's a desk. That's an icon desk there. So that's yeah. So that control. Yeah. So the control. All right. So that that is not adding any character to anything, right? It's controls. No. So it's you controls, you decide yeah. on the based on each particular project what flavor you want to add with your with your gear. Yeah, you could. I mean, a lot of people would argue that a control surface is is sort of um, doesn't impart a sound, which it doesn't technically impart a sound, but right. it does very much affect the way you hear things. And I think it goes back to that whole thing about looking at waveforms and things on screens that affect your brain in a certain way that um, impart that basically influence your decisions and your decision making. And I think. 
that's where it comes into its own is being able to turn the screens off and carry on mixing and you're not you're not making decisions based on what you see as much as what you're hearing so you just you you're zoning in a lot more with your ears um and also just the fact of being able to do multiple things at once like on a mouse you know you can't turn down one fader while you pull another one up you know or just something as simple as that you can't do on a mouse you know so on this you can I can grab six faders and I can just be blending and moving them around and you know yeah. or I can be EQing something as I'm turning it up or as I'm turning it down or and those type of things are what they massively for me they massively influence the overall results of of your mix so, so your mix is then a performance yeah exactly yeah yeah and not only is it quicker but it's more creative and your you, it feels more it's just more tactile and it feels like it's the closest thing that I've this the closest situation I've had to being um to feeling like I'm working on a on a real desk again you know and that's but even then I wouldn't go back to working on a real desk after this because of the the functionality and the recall that it's just in this in this the industry just wouldn't I know some people still do, but for me, it doesn't work with my clients and what they want, you know. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's uh, I use the MC Mix, the Euphonics MC Mix, which was bought by Avid, and now it's the Avid Artist Mix. Yeah, and yeah. It, it does, even though it does not have a sound like you're saying, it affects how you mix. So, for yeah. instance, let's say you're using, the, um, let's say you're using a, a multiband compressor, and yeah. you set up on your your bass, you set up the bass so that the low end is doing what you want it to do. But then you want to set up a band of your bass around 2K where the, the finger picking is and mm -hmm. you want that to remain prominent. I can yeah. set up that band around 2K. I'm going to get that band on my board mm -hmm. and it's going to be on one of my rotaries but I can also, on the MC Mix, I can flip it down to a fader. So now yeah. I'm literally fading just the 2K region of the base. That's the key, man. I mean, you know, a lot, most of the time I, I, I do a similar thing, but I just split, like, in that instance of a base, I'll probably split it into two or maybe even yeah. three faders. And just being able to turn the low end and blend the low end with the high end, and it's like you can't do that with a mouse, however yeah. much you wanted to try, you know. Um, and just be I think it's just a, a better way anyway to split things up like that and you can you can push the high end or once you've got the low end controlled you might not want to push it or move it from that right place. because yeah, the low end is working well with your kick yeah you know, exactly you don't really want the low end to move but you need for the high end to move yeah yeah so that's that's where these control surfaces really come into their own you know you start in part it does have an influence on your final product even if it's not technically add in a sound, you know, but... You spoke about VCAs. What's a VCA and what are you using it for? Okay, well, um, am I right in believing that it, it's not available in s some Pro Tools? Logic. Right, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Logic okay, not VCAs either. Right, well, I didn't know that, but VCAs, if you look at um, uh, the traditional sort of SSL or Neve consoles, you have they call them groups on an Eve, but it's the same sort of thing. You you um you assign a, um different groups of faders to one fader as a master, and then you can basically so say for instance on your drums you might have eight, ten, twelve tracks of drums or something. You can assign all those faders to one master fader, um, and you can control the overall level or the mute or whatever um on just that one fader. Once you've got your balance of between between the the group or whatever, um, but it just makes for it's really um, I don't actually do a lot of rides on my VCAs really, um, but I do use the mutes quite a lot where you can um, I can call up um, the VCAs on here and I've got uh, hold on one two three four five six I've got twelve VCAs running on this mix at the moment. Um, and it's just like drums, percussion, bass, all the guitars, all the keys, all the events, all the vocals, all the backing vocals, all the effects. So basically, 
right in front of me there, I can isolate certain groups and sections of the mix, and it just makes for a much faster um, workflow in terms of you know if I just say if I just want to hear the vocals with the with the drums, I can just literally two buttons and there you go. Rather than fishing through my mixer trying to work out okay where's all the drums, where's all the vocals, I can just solo those two groups and isolate them because this is the thing about when I say solving problems in the mix at the mix stage rather than later on. And the VCAs really help you do that. So it's, say for instance in my mix it's sounding a little bit um, a little bit woolly in the low mids, then I can call this page up and I can go, all right, well where's that problem coming from? And I can literally just go through those twelve faders and work out what takes what gets rid of the problem more. And then I can do further investigation when I work out which VCA it is. I can then go into that group and go, okay, well, out of those 12 faders there, what's, where's that problem coming from? And I can get to it right at source rather than having to EQ my mix bus or something like that. And you can do it fast. I mean, you can do it without VCAs, but it takes a lot, of, a lot more hunting down of problems, you know? Okay, um, tell me if I'm wrong because you, you said um, on the old desks, I think you said SSL, they didn't have that many buses where we could submix. So mm -hmm. that's where VCAs came in handy. I'm asking because, you know, on Pro Tools we have so many buses. We don't, what you just described, yeah. I could just bus it and mute the whole thing. Um, but was that because they didn't have so many submixes? Well, you, um, well the thing is with the VCA, the, diff, the big difference really for me with the VCAs is that you can't apply processing to those VCAs. So you can't. It, like you, if you bust something out, you can put an EQ across that bus or a compressor. You can insert something across it. Whereas with the VCA, is all it's actually doing is um, is is becoming a master for that group. It's not so. It's just literally volume and mute and solo. You know, it's not. It's not. Um, you can't actually process it as a group in terms of adding an EQ or something. So that's the beauty of where we are with in the box mixing is we can create as many of these sort of stems if you like or groups and we can actually apply processing to them which you couldn't do on those those old boards you know all right are you have you have you tried this with the VCA say you put um, you have 10 tracks um, and you put an EQ on each one of them and have it to where when you move one EQ say you boost band 3 um, all of their bands boost do you know what I'm talking about <laughs> well, I'd do that. I'd group them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that with the VCA. I'd just group the plugin. I'd just group the insert, mm -hmm. so that whatever I do to one of them, it will do across the board. Is that what you mean? Or yeah, everything gets the same processing. Yeah. Well, well, well I, I'm not... you can you can watch all ten, all ten EQs adjust when you adjust one. Yeah. All ten will individually adjust. They yeah. You can just lock them together as a group. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. sure you can. I don't think you can do that from a VCA. Let me just have a little look. No, you you, you just do it. You just group those tracks. Um, obviously, it'd have to be the same plugin on each insert. Right. On, you know, right. Otherwise, same plugin on each insert. Yeah. Um, what, I, I haven't what? done it yet. I watched the tutorial where Kenny Goya uh, yeah. on Google3.com was doing it, and I was like, "Holy!" I cursed. Um, I was like, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> I was well, like, "You, you know what?" what? And I, I went to my Pro Tools, and I didn't have that. I was like, "Oh man!" <laughs> it was on the HD. I had to get on the HD system, huh? You should, can you not do that from uh, any Pro Tools rig? LE, I... the the LE like Pro Tools eight LE, um, yeah. doesn't have it. That's weird, man. I, I, I don't know. I mean, like I've, as I say, I've always. Um, I had to get I've... on my HD system. Um, and I forget which version um, had to get. It was a new add to the HD or whatever. And, right. But yeah, it, I I just thought the um, VCAs being able to do that, um, where I'd have a bunch of plugins and I could control like the ratio on a bunch of plugins with one ratio, have all the plugins go down, um, ratio go down. Do you know what? I'll have to investigate this a bit more because I'm not sure if what you're saying is. I've never, I've never, do, I've never controlled plugins from the VCA directly, so I'll have to look into that. But what I, what I do is, is I group, just group those that bunch of faders, and then you can control from any of those plugins across that insert, and it, it would go across the board. But one thing to watch for is the stereo mono, 
plugins. Mm -hmm. They're not compatible in Pro Tools, so which is really annoying. So that if you've got stereo mono plugins. Yeah, so if you've got like out of say out of your twelve tracks of drums or something, you've got an EQ plugin across them, but some of your tracks are mono. Stereo and some are mono. Okay. Yeah, then they won't mono group channel, together. Mono. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Interesting. It's really annoying. I don't know why. When you set up your VCA, look look for where um where you can do the plugins. Somewhere in the settings, there um you should see where you should be able to do um affect the plugins. Okay, I'll definitely get. It sounds like a great idea if you can do it. I just don't know how to do you, it. You might you might find a use for it. You might have you might you might come up with something and say, oh hold on, I could do you know. Yeah, you, that's you what I mean. Sounds, sounds like a great real idea. Yeah. Um. Have you already done that, Andrew? Do you do you know what I'm talking about? Um, no, I haven't done it yet, actually. Uh, what, controlling the plugins across a selection of channels with the VCA. Yeah, if you um, have ten, ten, 10 channels, 10 tracks, each having, say, the EQ37 band, and you boost band one um, all on one EQ or on the VCA, all of them... Um, oh, hang on. Uh, sorry, I know what you mean now. Sorry, um... I was I wasn't I was a bit confused then, but I know exactly what you mean, and I don't I don't use it, but I should do, yeah, because <laughs> I thought I thought you were look you were talking about inserting an EQ on your VCA fader, but there is no inserts on there. That's why I was confused. But oh no no no, I, I, I've I've never even done it, bro. I've just seen it and and just like was tripping out that it could be yeah. done. That'll um, be a, it'll be a setting in the preferences, won't it? That yes. I, yeah. I got a, a question from. Uh, my boss at Project Nine, uh, Andrew Spence. Um, he yeah, wants to know. Spence. Um, Spence. Shout out to to Spence. Ball headed <laughs> um, Spence with the new baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he wants to know what is your favorite, is favorite uh, style of music to master, and in his in your opinion, which one song that you've mastered has made the biggest difference to the song? Wow. Okay. First question: What style of music? Um, that's a really difficult one to answer purely because it's like say, say someone saying, um, you know, what's your what's your favorite album of all time or something. It's yeah. like my musical tastes are pretty wide. You know, when we grew, up, I grew up in, I was lucky enough to grow up with, um, like my parents uh, and my family as a rule just had so many different musical references when we were younger and. I grew up listening to just a, a massive range of stuff, and I think I also have been really lucky to be able to work on loads of different styles. Because I think what tends to what you tend to see happen is people get pigeonholed into a certain style, working on a certain style of record, and and that tends to be then all the jobs they get are based around that type of music. Um, and I've try, I've sort of tried my best to keep my work as wide as, as I can and, and you know luckily I've been able to you know still work on you know one thing I might, I might be working on like an urban pop thing and then a folk record and then a drum and bass thing or you know it's like literally chopping and changing from one thing to the other and I, I love that it keeps it really interesting Um you know the downside of that is that maybe I'm not the first name that people think of when they have a particular project, you know, say yeah. coming from an A&R. They might not think of me straight away because I've got that wide range of stuff going on instead of being, like, you know, very into one thing. Um, so to, for me to say, you know, what I enjoy mastering most, I'd say I'd say I go out my way to try and keep it as varied as, as possible. Um Although saying that, I've been working on a lot of, a lot of sort of um, club-based stuff that's crossing over to radio, a lot of urban things as well recently, the last couple of years, and that's down to um, a lot of the the sort of DJs and 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 producers of that type of record needing help with, especially with vocals actually, yeah. just getting because they 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 can make these club records all day long that work in that environment, but when they try and cross it over. This sort of sometimes struggling to, to get that there, but um, so yeah, I've been doing a lot of that, um, but still, you know, st still a lot of singer songwriter projects, a lot of pop records, rock records. Both. Just like keeping your ears fresh, man, so you don't get bored. Yeah, down. You know, and I like being able to chop and change between them as well. If I can, if I have the luxury in terms of time scales, I'll, I'll spend half a day on what on 
maybe a drum and bass record and then and then just do the rest of the day on like some like little jazz thing or <laughs> so, I don't know. And like and then, them choices might actually influence what you're mastering as well. So if or what you're mixing, because if you go from that drum and bass thing to the jazz, you might come at it a little bit differently, which might affect the song and improve it in some way, which you wouldn't have done well, otherwise from. Yeah, I mean sometimes. Jazz all day. Yeah, it could improve it or it might be detrimental to it. But I think <laughs> it takes it, it takes um, maybe it takes me half an hour to get back into the swing of something completely different. I might listen to a few records in between. Yeah. Have the transition, but I do like that variation of stuff. You know. Um, what was the other thing he asked about? Um, he asked. Let's see. Um, in your opinion, which uh. One oh, yeah. song that you've worked on has made the biggest difference to the song, so you mastering it has uh, improved it greatly. Um, mastering, if you were to, if that question was based on mixing, I'd say um, there's a record that I made with a guy called James Vincent McMorrow um, a year or two ago, and that that was um, it came to me in 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 a more sort of demo format, you know, it, it was right. recorded by the artist himself, and um, it was pretty shonky sounding sonically. Um, you know, it shonky. Was the first to sort of admit that. Um, I'm, I had to do quite a bit of surgery on it to, to get it there. But I think what he'd actually managed to do is, in the recording process, he'd managed to capture um, a lot of magic and something very special that. I don't think he'd have captured in a studio environment, so we wanted to keep that magic, but basically embellish it and fix the problems in it to to take it onto the you know to make it sound like a great record. And that yeah. wasn't a fast process, but it was very successful in terms of what we wanted to achieve without um without sort of spoiling any of the magic. So that record, I was really really happy with. Um, what we've done to it, and I mixed it, and I actually mastered it as well. Um, but the mass, I mean, you know, there's there's only so much you can do with stereo mastering, um, and I, I think to say there was like, a dr I don't think there's as much of a drastic difference in the stuff that you can do with than there is at the mix stage. Obviously, yeah. it's a lot more open creatively, um, but. As we've seen a lot more popularity with the STEM mastering, I'd say there's a lot of jobs that um, that we're making a big, big difference on um, from working from stems in, at the mastering stage. Um, but you know, as I say, where does it where does it become mixing? You know, those it's definitely blurring the lines that now as to like, are we mixing or are we mastering or what? You know, but it, it's a good solution for for many, many different. Projects at the moment that you know the mixes aren't quite right, but they're sort of nearly there, um, and we're totally nailing it, nailing it in those jobs, which is great. It's really good. Do you ever ever find that stuff that you've mixed and mastered that you struggle to maybe come of it, come to the mastering stage without that detachment from the music and that perspective, or do you just take plenty of time in between it to try and gain that back? It depends because, like, I did. Um, it's so about, do you know the Noisettes? As yeah, yeah. The Noisettes. Uh, I got hired to mix their record, but w what we actually ended up doing was it came to me and it needed needed quite a bit more work before we could mix it. Um, so we went back and did some recording, um, a lot of additional production um, and mixing. And then when it got to the mastering stage, it was we'd spent like three months on it and... I think by that point, as you say, it was. Um, I just wanted to put my trust in someone else to master it at that stage because I didn't have the luxury of taking a couple of weeks off from it. They needed it. They needed it delivered. So, in that instance, I actually got someone to master it who I really trust, and um, I sat in with him in in a different room, and we just we did it that way. Because, as you say, by that point, if you've spent so long on a job, the it's just human nature that you lose a bit of perspective as you go along, and unless you have a little break from it, then it can be a problem at the end, you know. But there's not many jobs now that I, that I'm involved in from scratch that I have to mix and, and master, so it doesn't really become an issue that often. 
Andrew says um, he asked that question. Andrew Spencer is not me. Um, <laughs> that he was just throwing in a curveball to see how you handled it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, just wait till we get more of this, and you can send him all the curveballs you want, man. <laughs> hey, listen, I've, I'm coming over to Manchester next week. <laughs> it sounds oh. Oh, oh, sounds like a hangout. Sounds like a Manchester <laughs> hangout. Break out the Guinness. Break out the Guinness. <laughs> Break out the Guinness. <laughs> Touch base, the, touch base after the chat, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything um, you would tell the guys um, who are jumping into mastering who don't have much experience in mixing? In mixing? Yeah, a lot of times we hear um, guy people will come up and say, um, if you're going to master, you should have some mixing experience. That's what they say. So oh, okay. guys who are just jumping straight into mastering, uh, what type of advice would you give them? Well... I'd say for, I'd say it's probably more important more important than ever before to 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 have experience in mixing purely because of the popularity of stem mastering now. Because as a mastering engineer, you're going to be getting sent stems all the time now, and unless you have experience of mixing, I'd say that's where you might fall down. I don't know. That's just my take on it, but. Oh, uh, speaking, you know what? Speaking of stems, uh, I'm sorry. Continue that, but add to this. Add to that. When you do these stems, are you adding effects to the stems? Yeah. So what I ask the way I, on um, the Loft Mastering website, there's there's some information about how to prepare stem uh, for stem mastering. So what to do, and that that I can put a link up on the um, on the group for that if you want. Um, yes. And that basically without without going into too much detail, what I ask people to do is to add the effects that are relevant to that stem into every stem. So if there's a, you know, if there's a reverb on the guitars, then put that reverb in the guitar stem and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You put all the vocal effects in the vocal stem. So, because the problem is if you, if you put, say you do all your stems dry and then you put an extra stem with all your effects in it then I can't adjust the levels or change anything in the stems because the effects went then won't make sense they won't translate so I wanna have the effects that are relevant to each instrument in that stem so that if I turn that stem down the effects will go down with it and vice versa do you find yourself using um, reverb when you're mastering at all Putting it across whole whole tracks or anything. Um, do you know, someone asked me this the other day. Actually, um, I have done in the past, um, not very often, but um, someone asked me this exact question recently, and I try I've tried it on a couple of things recently, just because I'd sort of forgot sort of forgot about it a little bit. But yeah. you'd be surprised actually how how effective it it can be on certain jobs. Um, you have to be very careful with it and. The only times that I have used it, I've tended to EQ the reverb return quite heavily, so it might only be just a certain range that that I'm imparting that reverb on. Right. Um, and I use um, what I used actually the last time I did this. I used the in the Oxford suppressor, sorry, the Sonox suppressor. There's an option to click inside, um, which which basically lets you listen to just what's in the bandwidth selection. Uh, and I sent the, 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 the send to the reverb, I sent through that. So I was literally, the reverb was only getting, I think it was the vocal range, so it might have been like just 1 to 4K or something. So the reverb was actually only receiving that frequency range. Um, and you've got to play around with it a little bit, but... I think it was just because the vocal was a bit dry or something. I can't remember. And we just, it wasn't a long reverb. It was like a room, like a short room or something mm -hmm. that was just adding a bit of space or I don't know. I can't remember. But I definitely wouldn't rule it out, but I'd say be very careful with it, you know. And I, I, I probably, the times I have used it, it's been quite sparing, quite, you know, quite mm -hmm. sparing. Really. That's interesting. So you were using the, the suppressor basically as a bandpass. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean you can do it with loads of different plugins, but yeah. that was just it's quite um it's quite a brutal um, I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> it's like there's no yeah. uh, sometimes that's exactly, 
that's some, sometimes that's exactly what you want is just to you know okay. sometimes I use that setting for I mean it's, there's, there's another setting on it called outside which basically gives you everything outside of the selection yeah and that's great for stuff like um, for like backing vocals or something where you want them to sound contrast into the lead sure so I'll find I'll I'll sort of sweep the bandwidth till it's right where the vocal is, mm -hmm. and then I'll just take that right out of the backing vocals. Sometimes, you know, not all the time, but I've done that nice. before and it's worked really well. Um, as I say, like mixing generally for me is more about what you take out than what you put in. You know, to create to to create space and power and impact and all those things. It's like it's not what you put in. It's it's the stuff you take out and the room that you create for the things that matter. I guess. But, so a lot more subtractive EQ for you than additive. Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I might mix a job tomorrow that totally contradicts that. <laughs> but that's just my first approach: is to to look at something and go, okay, what can I take out before I think about what I'm putting in? You know. And does it do the characteristics of the EQ? have anything to do with your decisions as far as whether you're going to use subtractive or additive such as you were saying you like to do subtractive with the waves Q10 yeah because it's 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 not um it's less intrusive so if you've got something that's got you can just hit that button it's asking if you're asleep it's gonna <laughs> <laughs> um yeah ba basically um most of I find as a general rule that if I'm if, with subtractive EQ, if I can get if I can get the Q as tight as I, as possible to remove the problem without affecting everything else around it, then that to me works better than if you start carving out big wide bandwidths, then um, that for me becomes a, a, a bit of an issue. And I think um, it's it's the opposite for stuff when you start adding in character to things if you start boosting frequencies I tend to find that the the wider cues work a bit better but not all the time you know sometimes you you can boost really tight cues as well if it you know if it needs it but generally subtractive it's like I just try and get rid of the the problem without anything around it you know do you have any uh, general advice for people who at cuz as you said at this point the idea of going into a studio for weeks and weeks and then doing a song is over pretty much and basically people are doing things on their laptops and then eventually they're either bringing it to somebody for a finishing mixing type of thing or for mastering. Do you have any tips for these laptop mixers who are planning on sending their tracks to mastering any general stuff? Um. I'd say uh, there's another link that I can put up from the website about this, about how cool. to prepare a pre-master um, cool. and a good pre-master. Sorry. Um, and the first thing to say is keep keep some headroom for the for the mastering guy. Even if you're sending stuff to your client and to the, to your art, the artist loud, you know, for vibe or whatever, always give the mastering guy. Um, options with the headroom, you know. By all means, you can send them the limited version for Vibe and say, "This is what everyone's been listening to. This is the sort of thing we want." But here's a quieter pre-master for you without the compression and the limiting on or whatever for you to work from. Um, because a lot of the time, we do get sent files that are that are clipping already, and it, it's sure. you can't really undo that. You know, it's difficult to. And when you it, say headroom. I think a lot of people are confused about that because what they'll do is they'll send something that the actual file is minus 60 VFS. Yeah. But, but the dynamic range is like this, right? Well, and this is so are we talking about when you say send some headroom to the mastering engineer, are you talking about dynamic range or are you talking yeah. about because it seems to me that if somebody sends you something with proper dynamic range but it's peaking at minus 0.5 dBFS, the mastering mm -hmm. engineer could just turn it down and use it. Yeah, that's but fine. If, you totally but if, but if you send something, you know what I'm saying, that's lower. The dynamic range, yeah. Because more often than not, if when you see that and it's minus 6 but it's squashed up, what they've done, they've, they've turned it down post-limiting. <laughs> right. 
don't know. So it's already got the distortion in it that you didn't yeah. want. So yeah, you, good point. You know, it's it's about it's all about sending the 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 mastering engineer the pre limited um, files so that he can you know there's no there's no additional distortion that you've added in that limiter that he's then going to have to add on to again. Um, cool. So yeah, I mean, it, I think I think really if people, I mean, obviously this information is on. It's not only on on our web, website, but most mastering houses they'll have this sort of info on the websites about how best to prepare things. And you know, most people are open, really open to, to chatting and helping people along the process. And you know, I always say to people, call me. You know, I, even if I don't even know you, just call me and I can guide you through the process. Or, or you know point you to the right places on the website or whatever. Um, so that's one thing I say is don't be afraid to contact mastering guys and ask them questions and send them files to a, you know, a lot of the time people will say, oh, can I just send you this mix just to, just for your thoughts or, and I love all that because it makes for a better, better result. You know, if someone sends me something and like the, this, you know, the, the, there's an element clashing with something else in the, in the mix, it's like, I'm not going to be able to fix that in mastering. So, Right, they flagged it at the right time, and I can just go. You know what? Just give me that separate, or just EQ that a little bit differently, or whatever, and that'll help. And and a lot of that is just basically letting someone else hear it in a different room with decent monitoring, and you know, this, these are the things that that make. Oh, actually, it. you just you just reminded me before we get to Andrew number one with Andrew number two's question. Uh, you just reminded me um, when you're using something like Source Live, or you're using. A nice cast, and you're in your studio, and somebody is listening on their system, whatever that is. Mm. Uh, how much does their system affect what you're sending them? You know what I'm saying? Like you're you're listening to what you're mixing, but you're sending it to them. They might be listening on barefoots or focals, or they might be listening yeah. on computer speakers. Yeah. So, well, I mean this. <laughs> I always ask people what they're listening on. Right. <laughs> so I've got a reference point, um, and that always helps. But I guess like you've got a, um, you know, if someone's if someone's listening on a certain type of monitor, then I'll probably ask them if they if they know those how well they know those monitors. Okay. What the frequency um, range, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, and if if they're not if they're not sure, you know, if they're in someone else's studio or something, and they're listening on speakers they don't know, then I'd. I'd flag that up front of the session and say, listen, get in there and listen to a few records before we start and just make sure you've got a benchmark. Um, okay. I mean, that's the other thing I'd say about when you asked, asking about, when Matt was asking about um, people working on their laptops and mixing away and stuff, the thing that's so key as well, I mean, and some people might disagree, but I just think listen to records all the time. You know, even if you're in a hurry to finish yeah. something. In that environment, yeah. Some people are like, oh shit, you know, I've got to finish this today. I haven't got time to be listening to records. It's like, just keep listening to records all the time because that's your benchmark, man. And it's like so important, especially when your ears start getting tired. It's like, just keep the vibe and just keep listening to records all the time. Um, now, that can be a bit of an issue when you're comparing mastered records with your mix that's not mastered. But that's something that you've just got to bear in mind and remember that. There is a difference there, you know, um, and this is where the mock mastering comes in quite useful because you can at least get your track up to a relatively similar level with a limiter, and the stuff that you're AB in then has a bit less of a difference, you know. Um, cool. So um, I might just jump in with uh, Andrew two's question, Andrew yeah, one, yeah. whichever one you wanna. Um, <laughs> Project call him one. He's he's my boss. Um, <laughs> so he's just asking if you're hearing any sort of um, new genres or styles of music coming through your doors quite a lot recently. I know you mentioned you're hearing a lot of club music wanting to reach the radio, mm. but is there anything stylistically you're hearing a lot different in this uh, post dubstep world? <laughs> what art? You mean like creatively or? Yeah, yeah, as in like genre wise or anything that's new on the horizon that you've picked up on. I mean, this is one of the. This is one of the great things about mastering as opposed to mixing and producing is you get into here a lot more stuff because then mm. the turnaround is a lot faster. 
So it, it's um, that's one of the things that I find really exciting about it is like mastering. It might not be as creative um, as as mixing or producing, but mm. you're definitely getting to listen to a lot more projects and 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 um, you know there, there is there's a lot of um, I mean, it's it's. I don't think there's. I wouldn't say there's any more or less creativity nowadays. But I'd say that there's definitely um, the standout jobs that come through, and you just think that is so fresh and so unique, and and those type of things. And then you'll get jobs that you think sound like something that they're trying to be, that on the back of a very successful artist or something like that. So. You know, it's pros and cons. There's there's great stuff. There's there's not so great stuff. And um, can you give me any any names that you've worked recently that you thought that's going to go somewhere, or you know, or that's really interesting? Um, there's um, I've been working with a a a band, not maybe not a band, but a a, pair, a couple of DJs called Digitalism. Okay. Um, they're from Hamburg, and I've been working with them on a couple of projects. Their sound. Is incredible. It's like um, I guess it's some people would say it sounds sort of that like French house thing maybe, but it's just got right. a, an energy and a, an aggression to it that is just so on fire. Like it's amazing. And they they've just done. Uh, I just mixed a record for them with um, there's a band from LA, Young 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 Blood Hawk, um, that they featured on this digital album record. That sounds really fresh. Um, there's a a DJ from London called Riton that I'm actually mixing today, um, and he's um, he's just like so at the forefront in terms of like club and stuff. He's like it's got so, so I mean his work rate is ridiculous as well. The amount of stuff that he comes through with, um, he's great. Um, what else is going on? Um, there's a guy called Youssef, DJ from Liverpool that. I've been working with his sounds like incredible, um, <laughs> but very much like a club thing. Um, yeah. But he's got he's got a he's got a much wider mentality musically than what maybe a lot of house G DJs would have. Um, God, what else? Um, there's so many different things. Um, I'm sure that I'm sh I'll probably go off air later and go. Oh, I should have mentioned that because there's just so many great things. Um, well, yeah, that's just there's just a few there. Um, cool, man. I'll ch I'll check them out. Like, which of the first one was Digitalize or Digitalism? Digitalism. Digitalism. Yeah, yeah. Incredibly talented, man. Incredibly talented. But you know, these and the, what's great about working with the, with them is that they're out DJing all the time, and and I'm sort of in the studio, and just being able to get their take on what works at club level is. Is actually been a really good learning curve for me, um, yeah, and you know, hopefully vice versa. They they've sort of picked up um, some radio mentality from me, you know, about how to sit right. sit the 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 rec their vocals and the generally their, their their sound on the radio, and but still make it work at club level. So it's a team effort, you know, of basically yeah. taking their skills and my skills and making the best of the two. Things and that's worked really well. So there's there's loads of different different things. Cool, man. Right. Cheers. Compression. Um, do you do your compressors reduce the um, stereo image? And if so, um, what do you do to comp to to keep that from happening or to, to compensate? Um. Well, one of the things I'd say for at the mix stage is make sure that you have. A way of working in mono, and that it's that it's uh, you can switch in and out of that really easily. So obviously, I can do it. If you've got if you're on a console, you can do it very easily. But if you're just mixing in the box, try and get hold of some little unit like a monitor controller thing that you can mono. Um, you can do it in plugins, I guess, as well. But um, I do a lot of that. I switch in and out of mono all the time, and um, especially EQing and creating space. Like I'm working. Making sure that you keep the space for vocals and stuff like that. Always EQ in mono because then you're. It's so much more obvious when you're getting in the way of other things. Or do you know what I mean? Yeah, you're saying. You're saying go ahead, Bill. I, I was just saying you're saying some of the two bus to mono 
Like yeah. for instance, their their Brainworks plugins, BX Control, etc., that have a mono maker. You can crank yeah. that all the way to twenty two thousand. So your whole channel is now mono. So you're saying yeah. if you if you EQ while you're listening to it as a summed mono track, that makes things more obvious as far as when things are getting out of the way of each other. Yeah. So say let you know, here's an example. You've got um, say you've got a stereo piano and yeah. a vocal. Um, because if you're listening in stereo, if it's quite a wide piano recording, then you might have similar frequencies in the piano and the vocal that you're not that aren't really a problem in stereo because there's the space for it. Whereas sure. as soon as you mono it, they're all fighting those same frequencies are fighting and clashing in the middle. So that's the that's the for me that's the right time to start EQing something is put it in mono and then make sure nothing's clashing in mono. Then when you go back to stereo all of a sudden, you've just got all this space that you've created, you know? Nice. And if you did that, you would do that with the whole mix? Or, like, let's say you took your stereo piano example. Would mm. you would you just take the stereo piano bus, which is whatever the piano is and whatever the effects are, mm. send those to the two bus, mono those, and then work on those by themselves to make sure they're not yeah. interfering with each other? So it's only in the context of the full mix. Well, not the full mix, but definitely in the in context. So whether that's just the vocal in the piano, or whether it's the whole mix, or whether it's um, you know all the keyboards, all the guitars, no drums, no bass, vocal, or but I tend to always leave the vocal in. Like um, there's a little trick you can do in Pro Tools and probably in most of the workstations where you can just put something. Some, yeah, exactly. So and we used to do that on consoles years ago, like you. You know, you just make sure that whenever you solo something, um, you, the vocal's still still there in the way. So it just forces you to make sure that you just don't get in the way of that vocal, whatever you're doing. Really you know. Cool. Okay, so what you're saying is basically you will test not in solo, but you will test perhaps in so maybe you're not saying this perhaps in solo, but with the vocal solo safe, so the vocal is always there, just yeah. to make sure that whatever you're doing in stereo is not conflicting with what you're doing on the, the vocal. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't just apply to... That's a good idea. I'm going to start doing that, that immediately. <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't just apply to stereo stuff. It's like literally everything, because for the type of records that I mix are very much vocal-led, you know, like um, vocal is king, really, and it's all about the song and the vocal, and and so why would you... It doesn't make sense to get a great sound and piano if it's getting in the way of your vocal, you know? Sure. So sure. it's like the the vocal is king, so leave it leave it there. Get the vocal sound that you want and then just make sure that everything else you do is is is, is sculpted around that. And the only way that you can yeah. really do that is to keep it in the mix, you know, as you as you EQ and stuff. Yeah, that's a great idea. Do you go ahead, I'm listening. Okay. Right, well I was gonna say, uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier was that there are really only so many targets that a person can listen to at the same time. It's basically three. So is that the way you approach a mix as far as here are going to be my three main elements and then I'm going to sculpt everything else around that? Yeah. Did we talk about that earlier? Or did we did. You did. You mentioned it. Go no, watch yourself on YouTube. You mentioned it. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's the way I tend to approach things. Is 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 work out. Usually, first thing I'll do is listen to the rough mix of uh, of the job. If it's a mix project that I'm doing, um, and I'll just try and decide wh what are the the main elements uh, and and basically feature them. You know, uh, and it's generally always the vocal, and it might be like on this track today that I'm working on. There's there's like a sort of piano, distorted piano type thing that runs like pretty much all the way through the song and it's that's got the hook in it and that's like, so that's pretty important. Um, you know, and aside from that, everything else is secondary really, you know, so for this particular job that I'm working on now, it's going to be like vocal, that piano hook and the beats really and everything else is going to be sculpted around it. Nice. So. But every job's different. You've got to make that decision of like, okay, what takes priority here? Because you can't, for something to be loud, something else has got to be quiet, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? So 
that's just the decision you have to make it, about how you approach it at, at the start, you know? Definitely. I was asking about compression um, in the stereo image because a lot of the times when I compress, uh, some of these compressors reduce the stereo image. Yeah. And, um, I was asking how do you compensate for that or what do you do to keep, if you have a compressor that's reducing the stereo image, what right. do you do to make that compressor stop reducing the stereo image or to compensate for it? Okay. You know what? I, I don't really have that problem. I mean, what what's the... What do you know? What compressors they're using, or? Well, for one, the the stock compressor that comes with Pro Tools. Um, what I what I ended up having to do was unlink the sides. Um, yeah. And, and and I would keep the the st uh, more of the stereo image. Um, the L the L two by Waves. Um, mm. I ended up turning arc off when I wanted to keep more of the stereo. It's stuff like well, that, and I was just huh. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, what, obviously it depends on the content, the, th the thing that you're compressing, but that right. linking is quite important. So obviously, if there's something, you know, if you it, you might want to treat the two sides separately. You know, you might not want to. That might be half the problem is that they're trying to do an overall compression and the content is confusing the, the issue. But, um, I mean, I don't really tend to... I, I can't think of an instance where I've sort of had that problem where... And I, I do use that. I mean, I use the Digi compressor quite a lot. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. It's it's, favorite tools. Do you know what's um, great about that plugin is it's just so transparent. It just sort of does the job and nothing else. And it's and it's versatile. The um, do you um, what about stereo imaging? You don't so you don't do much um, you don't use stereo imaging type plugins on mixes um, when you're mastering that much. Again, you've got to be very careful with them. I do use them, but um. You've got to be very, very careful with them because you know yourself from experiences. Like the wider you send something, the less mono you you end up with. And this is where this is why I say try and mix in mono. You know, for fifty percent of the time, maybe, and you'll notice that when you you might widen something and think, oh, that sounds great, and then you switch it to mono and it's disappeared. You know, so you you've got <laughs> you just got to be very careful with those those type of situations. I mean some quite like um quite like you, you you know sometimes when you widen say just the mids and you keep the bottom end fairly mono and yeah. then maybe in the highs just don't do anything with the highs but maybe just widen in the mids is I've been doing quite a bit of that recently and that works really well. And you've done um, that why? Because you keep the mono compatibility for the bottom end, so the low end still sounds strong. Um, and I can sometimes find that if you widen the high highs, the air, it can be a bit overpowering and, and distracting. So I just find that the mid, just widening the mids is really effective, and but you, you still got that mono compatibility of the bottom end, really powerful bottom end. Yeah. That just came up on the group, actually. Somebody yeah. asked exactly that question. They were like, well, I heard that somebody expands the middle, but they don't expand the highs, and they mm -hmm. crunch the lows. And, you know, that's something you can do with BrainWorks Digital. That's something you yeah. can do with Ozone. It's like you can yeah. select your zone, and you decide what you want to do with it. Yeah. Well, the, the beauty of this is an interesting um, thing to try, is if you get... Um, one of those plugins where you can actually listen to just the sides or just sure. the just the mono content. Um, it's actually quite interesting. Just sending a few records that you're really familiar with, sending them through the yeah. plugin, and just listen to what is actually in the sides and what is in the middle. And it's actually quite an interesting um, experiment, you know. And you realise there's there's very little low end in the in the sides of tracks that are very punchy. Um, and that's something that obviously I do a lot of that in mastering is is a lot of stuff comes in and it's got this very um, it's got a lot of low end in the sides and it, you can you just lose impact and and power and obviously it has implications with vinyl pressing and all sorts of things. So sure. um, as a rule, I'll always check that and make sure that everything in the low end is pretty mono. Um, and you know, a lot of projects straight away, you just notice this punch arrive, you know, straight away. Um, you can even get stuff cancelling, you know, at the sides that shouldn't 
that they shouldn't be there. So you know, it's it's an interesting experiment just to to fire up some records through those plugins and just hear what is actually going on in the in the sides and stuff. I yeah, can't remember a... who said it, but um, they were saying that if you, they had a piano that was conflicting with a vocal, they would move whatever in the piano that's in the vocal range off to the sides. Um, yeah. I, I, I can't remember who it was, but it, it was in that post that Bill's talking about in Pensado Students. Yeah, I mean, I'd have, uh, obviously, as I say, I'd have, I always approach everything on its own merit, so without yeah. hearing that piano sure. and vocal, I don't know, but... But again, yeah, that won't help based on what Mike was saying earlier, which is that even if you move it to the sides, if you sum it to when mono, it, it might still be conflicting. Well, with isn't it? It. Yeah. But, you know, it might have worked for that particular right. song, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, but, what, you, what you said um, is another thread that's also in the group, which was my thread, which is I use Klanghelm VUMT, and what VUMT lets you do is you can either use it in a left-right or mid side, and yeah. put it in mid side. You duck the sides, and you listen to commercial tracks in mid, and you get mm -hmm. the idea of this is what mid sounds like. And mm -hmm. then you do the opposite, where you take all the mids out, or you could do there's a there's a free one from Voxengo uh, MSCD. It'll do the same thing, but yeah, you take out all the mids and you listen to the sides. Now you can hear all the vocal delays. Now you can hear all this other stuff that were yeah. previously being masked by the middle. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm. And it's a, and it's a great tool to to be able to just analyze those things on re you know records coming from mastering. It's like the first time you hear something, you want to be able to work fast on it and work out where the problems are. And that's a great tool to be able to just go right. Okay, where's this problem coming from? Isolate that. Nice like that, but so yeah, all good tools. For all you guys who are listening who do not have these tools, import a track, duplicate it, take one of them, move the left to the right, the right to the left, and then uh, flip the phase. Or uh, what do you call it, Bill? You're not gonna beat me up with polarity. <laughs> I am. I am. I was muted because I was typing. Polarity, thank you. Not phase. Polarity. <laughs> Um, because what what will happen is um the middle will disappear. Yeah. Um, Matt, get... I think am I am I right in believing that one of the Brainworks plugins is free? Am I I, I haven't actually yeah, got it here, but I'm sure Brainworks solo. Yeah. I th that'll do matter. that'll do widening. I don't know that it'll do mono making, but it'll definitely do widening. Can you listen to the sides and the mid separately? Or I think there is a button. I'll look it up. I'll put a link in the group. Because if it, you know the. It, I'm, yeah, I haven't got it here, but I'm, I've used it before, and it's free, and that does the job. So, I'll put a link right now. It's, it should be Brainwork Solo. Great, good stuff, man. Um, do you know what? I've just realized the time. It's like, yeah, bro, you better get out. Of, you better get to work. You talking all day? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, all right. So, is there anything else, fellas? And got nothing. Not Just for me. This is great. We'll we'll oh, we'll do this again soon, Mike. Really appreciate your time. This is great. Oh no, man, it's an absolute pleasure. And you know what? As well, like keep the conversation rolling. If there's you know if there's anything I can sort of help out with along the way, let me know, man. I'm there. Cool. We got we got a thread on the group that we've been working on. So just jump on in, and we'll we'll continue this in text. Yeah, wicked. All right, man. Brilliant. I'll do my best to keep up with that. Anyway. We're very Thanks, appreciative, man. Mike. Don't no worry, man. Take care, yeah? You look after yourselves. Appreciate you guys. Uh, Cheers. It was a pleasure, guys. See you later, guys. Yeah. All right, bro. Uh.